So what I want to talk today about is indeed subjective beliefs in, in asset pricing. And uh, to get us started, let's just uh, consider the you know, standard asset pricing uh, relation that we often work with in asset pricing. And I'll make some remarks about, about that. Uh, so consider an asset that pays a dividend in the future. Uh, and there's an agent or there are agents valuing this asset in an asset market. And so our usual asset pricing relationship says that this should be, the price should be the uh, expected cross product of a stochastic discount factor that reflects investors' uh, preferences and of these payoffs. And these expectations are taken based on some information that uh, investors observe at time t. Now, you, note, you can note that I put a tilde on the expectations operator here. And I did that because I wanna make sure um, we emphasize here that when investors value an asset at the time t, they do it based on whatever the be beliefs they hold at this point in time about this cross product of the SDF and, and the payoff. And these beliefs may be rational, they may, maybe not. Uh, they may be based on you know, a correct understanding of how the world works or maybe not, right? And that's, that's sort of the thing that I wanna talk about today. How do investors come up with these uh, subjective beliefs about how the future uh, is going to look like. If you have an asset that, uh, you know, in a multi-period setting where the asset has not just a payoff next period, but also a price because it continues to you know, exist for multiple periods, then, uh, you know, the, the uh, valuation would also involve a future price. And so in this, this case, you can also get uh, expectations of agents about future prices of assets uh, matter for the, the, the evaluation of the asset at time t. Okay, so what sort of beliefs are we going to talk about? Um, if you think about valuation for stocks, obviously, you know, dividend expectations are going to play a role or maybe earnings expectations, you know, based with some sort of uh, model for how these earnings translate into, into payouts. Uh, if you're talking about bonds, then it's inflation expectations or interest rate expectations that would matter. Uh, for options, we would have volatility expectations or expectations of higher moments. Uh, and for all of these assets, we can also talk about return expectations. What do we investors think uh, returns are going to be on these, these different assets in the future? Okay. Now, if you look into the literature on asset pricing, you know, over the last few decades, um, despite the fact that beliefs are in a way so central to asset valuation, the study of investor beliefs was at least until recently kind of mostly absent, right? Um, and there's a good reason for that. The reason for that is that the sort of standard paradigm in asset pricing and you know, for, for many years was the rational expectations paradigm. And uh, just wanna emphasize here, when we talk about rational expectations here in this talk, uh, like in you know, many places in the literature, uh, rational expectations is actually something that is much stronger than just saying agent beliefs are rational. What it really means is that agents are rational and they also know the true data generating process, inclu you know, including the functional form, the, the values of the parameters uh, in that data generating process. Yeah? And so based on, uh, based on that knowledge about really how the world works, the data generating processes, agents can then take uh, information that they see at time t, and given some observed variables, they know exactly how to form an expectation uh, based on that. Uh, and that's what I'm going to label an objective expectation, you know, based on knowledge of the true data, trader, data generating process. And the rational expectations model would say, well, agents' expectations at any point in time are equal to these objective expectations. Yeah? And this is in a way extremely convenient and you know, nice in some sense, because it kind of gets rid of this need to study beliefs because it's basically based, these beliefs are pinned down by the objective reality uh, that one assumes uh, in, a, in a model. Okay, okay. And, and, and this is still you know, very widespread, of course. Um, it's not always explicitly noted that a researcher is building on a rational expectations assumption, but Basically, anytime you see a, a paper where a researcher assumes that there is, you know, 
some conditional expectation that investors in the model are forming and they know exactly how to translate observed variables into, an, uh, into this expectation. This is basically uh, a rational expectations model. Similarly, if you see empirical work, where research is assuming that if you take data on some, you know, some variable X, this could be returns or you know, something else. And if, you, if, the, if the researcher assumes that a sample average of that uh, observed variable is you know, approximately equal or in a limit equal to uh, the agent's unconditional expectation about this X, then that's also based on a rational expectation assumption, right? And so we, very often we do this in empirical studies, right? We say we have, for example, an observed risk factor with some returns, and we are trying to figure out risk premia. And then we say, let's observe a large sample of returns. Let's take a sample average. And this must now be a good estimate of the risk premia that investors ex ante wanted from this, from this factor, right? And that's, that's also kind of rational expectations logic uh, that's underlying this. Okay, so as I said, the nice thing about rational expectations is from a modeling viewpoint is that there is no need to really study belief formation because beliefs are pinned down by the objective reality that the, model, the modeler uh, uh, assumes uh, in setting up an asset pricing model. Yeah? So that's in a way, of course, nice. But on the other hand, uh, it may be too strong of an assumption and it may miss uh, important drivers of, of asset valuation if we just assume that beliefs are pinned down by the objective reality in this way. And so things have been changing a little bit. Um, I pulled from Google Scholar uh, the number, the counts every year, uh, the number of papers that mention investor beliefs and the number of papers that mention asset prices. And I took the ratio of those. And so you can see since 2010, there has been a marked increase in the number of papers looking into investor beliefs. Yeah? Uh, and so that's also what I want to talk about today. All right, so let's, let's start with a very simple uh, reduced form framework to think a little bit about what subjective beliefs dynamics may do to, to asset prices. Yeah? Uh, so I'm going to set up a very simple framework now where we're going to have an asset that pays some dividends, dt. And when I use logs, uh, I'm going to use uh, uh, so, so, so small caps and and um, uh, so, and, and uh, a delta D is then the first difference of that. And so we basically have the first difference of log dividends uh, being a very simple process, just a constant plus some uh, IID epsilon shocks. Yeah? Okay, and we'll do some back of the envelope calculation now with this by using a Campbell Schiller approximate present value identity. And to, just to understand, what happens to asset prices when we have movements in subjective beliefs? Uh, first, a few words about the Campbell Schiller approximate present value identity, just to make sure everybody is on the same page here. I'm not going to derive it, but just a few remarks on, 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 on what, what this uh, present value identity does. Yeah? Um, it would be super simple if we only had a single period left, right? And all we had was one more return. Uh, which is then just the payoff of the asset next period over the current price, which we can rewrite uh, like this. And then by taking logs and rearranging, we would get a very simple relationship that says, you know, log price minus log dividend. So the log price dividend ratio is equal to the change in log dividends minus the returns. Yeah. And what this tells us is that if today the price dividend ratio is high, then this must mean either that next period we're going to get a lot of dividends, so high dividend growth, or we're going to see low returns. Yeah? So mechanically, it has to be one of the two. And that's sort of the idea behind the Campbell Schiller uh, identity. Um, it's basically just a multi period version of this of the single period relationship here. Yeah? And you need to do a little bit more approximation uh, 
to make this nicely linear in a multi-period setting, but the logic is sort of exactly the same as, as for, for the single period version here, which is exact. Yeah, so in, if one goes through the Campbell Schiller machinery and does some log linearization and also rules out that there are explosive doubles in the, in the long run, uh, then, then uh, one gets something that looks like this, which is very similar to the sing single period relation in the sense that we have on the left-hand side, the log price dividend ratio, then a, a constant that's not gonna play much role in what I'm gonna talk about. And then we have uh, basically a discounted sum of future dividend growth and future returns on the right-hand side. Yeah? And as, as in the single period relation, these returns enter with a negative sign here. Yeah? So this means when today the price dividend ratio is high, it must either be that future dividends are gonna be uh, you know, growing fast, or it must be that future returns are going to be low, yeah? one of the two. Okay, and now we can use this relationship to think a little bit about uh, what subjective beliefs do to asset prices, uh, subjective beliefs about uh, fundamental payoffs, uh, uh, to be precise. Okay, so first we can think about the rational expectations case. Yeah? So let's take objective expectations here, uh, conditional on information at time t. And so what does this represent? Well, this represents what an agent equipped with knowledge about the underlying data generating processes would expect, and also what an econometrician who gets a large sample of data and can you know, run uh, predictive regressions and so forth uh, on that large data set, what that this econometrician would approximately estimate huh? in terms of what the expected uh, expectations of, of these variables are in this, in this role. Okay, so if you take objective expectations here, uh, just let me go back under this assumption, right? So the, 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 for example, if agents know that this is the data generating process, then the expectations of any future dividend growth is just gonna be this mu, right? So that's just gonna be uh, constant. And so in this identity here, the delta D terms, they all collapse basically then after ex taking expectations into a constant, which is this here. Yeah? And what remains are expectations, you know, that we haven't specified further yet, expectations about future uh, returns. Yeah? So in this world where dividends have this IID process with you know, constant mean, all variation in the price dividend ratio, uh, if it varies over time, it must be due to variation expectations about these future returns because the rest in this identity is just all constant. Yeah? Okay, so this, this is the usual uh, sort of approach in, in, in you know, many asset pricing studies that have also shown that empirically under objective expectation, this seems to be largely what's going on. That when the price dividend ratio varies over time, it's largely due to expectations about uh, future returns. And there's not too much action about expectations uh, of dividends. And, and what I wrote here is kind of the extreme version of that where there's nothing happening with, with expectations of dividend growth. Okay, and then you know, people have built models of why expectations of returns, uh, rational expectations of returns would vary over time. There are models of time varying risk that induce you know, agents to demand time varying risk premia. There's also models of time varying risk aversion uh, and so forth. So you know, there's many more uh, papers on this, disasters, time varying disasters and, and so forth. But the question I wanna ask now is, well, could maybe, you know, everything here was based on rational expectations, could actually maybe uh, subjective expectations that vary over time of these dividend growth terms be an alternative explanation of why we see the price dividend ratio varying over time. Yeah? And so I just wanna look just mechanically how in, in this present value identity framework, how this would play out. Okay, 
And so let's make a, a number of assumptions. Um, let's say we have a constant log risk rate. Uh, and by the way, we'll talk about, about a much more general approach and model later, but for now, we're gonna keep it very simple with some uh, stark, uh, rather stark assumptions. Yeah? So we're gonna have a constant uh, log risk rate. rate. Um, we are going to have investors having subjective growth expectations that are not necessarily equal to this rational expectation of dividend growth, which is just this constant mu. Instead, these subjective expectations, which are labeled mu tilde t, they could vary over time. Yeah? And we'll specif specify later how they might vary. For now, we just say, you know, they could be varying over time in some, some sort of way. Okay. And then the third assumption is that investors price assets such that under their beliefs, they price in a subjectively constant risk premium, right? So the subjective equity premium is constant. Yeah? So they have, you know, maybe they perceive constant risk, they perceive they have a constant risk aversion. And so the price assets such, such that under their beliefs, they think the risk premium that they're going to, going to earn is, is constant. Okay. And now we can go back to um, that uh, present value identity. Let me just go back. And I'm again going to take expectations of this, but now I'm going to take subjective expectations, right? Uh, under these assumptions that I have just uh, specified. Okay, and what we get is kind of intuitive. So all of these dividend growth terms, they now collapse into um, this subjective dividend growth beliefs related term, right? Um, and all of these return terms that we saw there, they collapse basically into a constant related to the subjective risk premium, which we assume to be constant, and the risk rate, which is also constant. Yeah. Okay, so now with this, uh, these assumptions here, we have under subjective beliefs exactly the opposite sort of thing going on. We have a price dividend ratio that may vary over time but it varies, the source of variation is variation in these subjective dividend growth expectations yeah? that may vary over time. As I said, we haven't specified yet how they might vary and, and what would be perhaps empirically plausible, but for now, just note that we have a situation here where variation in these beliefs about dividends could drive variation in the price dividend ratio. Okay, and then of course, yeah, uh, the subjective expected return is constant. This is what we assumed. Now, an interesting question is, you know, suppose what we what we assumed here with these three assumptions, and you know, the result that we get here. Suppose this is how the data is actually generated. So this is how investors go about pricing these assets. And now think about an econometrician observer who comes in and looks at these asset prices ex post, collects a large sample of data on those, how would the dynamics of returns, the price dividend ratio and so forth, the joint variation of returns and the price dividend ratio, how would this look like to an outside, outside observer? Okay, so we're gonna imagine that an econometrician comes in now, samples data from this economy, and because the you know, econometrician samples empirical data generated by this economy, the estimates that an econometrician gets from these observed data, of course, then reflect the objective empirical you know, probabilities. Uh, and they, those could be different from the subjective beliefs of the investors that they had at the time, at the time when they priced these assets. Okay, so we'll try to figure this out. So I'm gonna, again, go back to equation one, right? Just a reminder, this was this present value identity. And I'm just going to rearrange this. Uh, I'm basically, basically taking, taking out these uh, one, the first of this delta D terms and the first of these return terms. I'll take them outside of the sum and then just rearrange a little bit. 
Okay, so I have the return term separately. I took it on the left side. I have this first dividend growth term separately. I left the rest in these summation terms. They, they now start the summation at one, not at zero. And I brought the price dividend ratio on the other side. So now on the other side, it's, it's a, a log dividend price ratio. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I did so far. And what we can do now is to substitute in the result that we just obtained. So this was this equation two. Let me just show you again what this was. So this was this result that we obtained of how in this world, under these assumptions, with investors pricing assets based on our subjective beliefs, how the price dividend ratio looks like. Right? So I'm going to use this now. And I'm going to say, OK, yeah, this is indeed how the price dividend ratio gets generated in this economy. And so let's plug this in. So I'm plugging this in here for this uh, log dividend price ratio. And then I take uh, subjective expectations. And I do this first, uh, taking expectation that t plus 1. So then the return that just stays the return because it's observed the t plus one. Um, but all of these uh, summation terms that involve you know, terms at t plus two, t plus three, and so, so forth, they basically now, now all collapse into, uh, into this here. Okay, and then with some further rearranging, uh, we, get, we get equation four. And now I take, ex okay, so, so this is now after taking subjective expectations, just to simplify. And now I'm going to do the crucial step. I'm going to ask, okay, now I want to know how this looks like objectively to an outside observer to this econometrician, right? So this is, this is how beliefs basically uh, generate these returns here. And now I want to look, like, look at how does this look like to an econometrician outside observer. So now I'm going to take objective expectations as of time t. And let me go back. Let's see what happens there. So for example, you know, this is just a constant. So it just stays a constant. This is a constant. An objective expectation of this, of this delta d, is just a true mean dividend growth, which is mu. And so we'll get a wedge between mu and, and this here. And then we get an objective expectation of this. And so that's what happens here. This delta D became mu. And here we just have an expectation of uh, the econometrician's expectation of future beliefs of the agent and the current beliefs of the agent. Yeah, and uh, about this, we cannot say much yet unless we make a specific assumption about how uh, these subjective beliefs evolve over time. Yeah. Okay, but. To note, um, we have here potential sources for predictable variation of returns, again, from the econometrician's viewpoint here, right? So for example, if there is a wedge between what the econometrician basically knows is the tr true uh, mean dividend growth and what the agent believes it is, this is basically a sort of mispricing, which would then show up uh, as a return premium. Yeah? In the same way, if the econometrician has a way of predicting how the agent's future beliefs are going to deviate from the current belief, and you know, this is maybe may based on some conditioning variable, also the, the econometrician can do that, this would be a source of predictable variation uh, in these returns. Okay. Now, to go further, of course, one needs now a model of subjective belief dynamics, right? To, to understand how this, this term here uh, would look like. Yeah? Uh, but uh, so far, we just see a potential source of predictability. But what sort of predictability you get depends on what, what the actual law of motion is uh, of these subjective beliefs. Okay. So I think now would be a good time for some questions. Alexi, did, you, did anything come up so far? There's one question so far, mm -hmm. just came up, in fact, so mm -hmm. that's good timing. Mm -hmm. um, question by Yushu, 
You would you like to speak up uh, and ask your question directly? Uh, yeah, hi. Sorry, my my internet connection might be a bit crappy, so I might time out. Uh, but okay, I think he was right about that. Um, his question is about equation four, um, uh -huh. where he says that the equation seems to assume that the law of iterated iterations expectations holds under the subjective probability measure. Is there a survey or experimental evidence that investors understand the law of iterated expectations? Uh, that's a great question. And I'm actually going to show you later a model where it does not hold under the subjective beliefs, at least not without additional assumptions. And so this is a great question. And I'm not aware of survey evidence or experimental evidence that speaks directly to this question. Um, there may be, uh, maybe I just cannot recall it or I haven't seen it, but uh, uh, I think it's a great question. And, and uh, it's, but I, I actually think here, I don't, so everything, after the, I think everything here, once the agent acknowledges that this, you know, uh, identity holds, everything I have done here is just a direct expectation of future dividends and for future returns. And so you could formulate this in a way that there is no iteration involved. It's just that the agent says, you know, I acknowledge the existence of this sort of identity relationship and, and an expectation of future dividends. You know, the, the, the agent basically values an asset directly based on the the stream of, of future payoffs rather than thinking about the future prices that an asset might fetch. But that's in a way, so, so that's how you could justify what I did here. But it is in a, in a sense, an additional assumption. So I've made the assumption that this is how the agent thinks about valuing the asset. You could also make an alternative assumption that the agent thinks about you know, the future price of the asset and then the agent has to think about expectations of future agents pricing that asset and then the law of iterated expectation comes into play and and there i agree it's not obvious that under subjective beliefs this holds and and uh, again i'll show you an example later where it doesn't it doesn't hold anything else no seven this 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 one's my own uh, uh -huh. question um it seems one of the things this 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 framework can deliver that standard asset pricing frameworks don't is negative conditional expected returns. Um, in, in in asset pricing, we we tend to always assume that there's a positive risk premium no matter right. how much the time varies. Um, and and here it can it can easily go negative. It seems if the effects are large, um, is that something that that, that we have evidence for? I, I do know there's. Um, some papers that find that in specialized circumstances, but for right. the overall asset market. Yeah, I think I think that's specialized circumstances is probably the the right way to characterize the current evidence. Some people have found little pockets here and there where it seems to be negative, but if you then ask statistically, you know how 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 strong is our confidence that it's really negative there or not? Yeah, I don't think it's very strong. So it's it's uh, so I guess there's no strong evidence. That, that it turns negative, but, but you're right, conceptually, absolutely. Okay, so let, let's, let's uh, go a little bit more towards models of subjective beliefs, right? To make some progress on, on, on getting a model that actually makes some predictions about how, how prices should move over time. And so, you know, a, a super simple uh, example would be one where the agent is just constantly off relative to objective beliefs. So, you know, and the ABLE had a paper uh, 20 years ago where there's constant pessimism. So this mu tilde is constantly always just lower than the true, true, true mu, right? And, uh, and uh, you could, you know, easily plug this in here and you would see what this, do, what this would do. So this term would disappear here and this here would just become a constant. And so this would mean just the equity premium is constantly elevated. That's all it does. Yeah? But it doesn't in introduce any sort of in interesting uh, time variation in expected returns. There's, there's one more question, Stefan. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's a good time for it. Mm -hmm. um, whether there's an implicit assumption here that the subjective beliefs are homogeneous. Um, 
and that if they're not, yeah. might the law of iterated expectations be violated for a different for that reason yeah, yeah. as well? Yeah, that's right. So I didn't I didn't spell this out, uh, but the implicit assumption here is that this beliefs are homogeneous. Uh, that's also what I'm going to stick to uh, today in the lecture, but it is, of course, a strong assumption and uh, a perfectly valid question to ask, you know, well, what about heterogeneity and how does, how does equilibrium play out with heterogeneous beliefs? And uh, there are also models of that. Um, so. In the, yeah, and the, then the law of iterated expectations, of course, also becomes you know, even more interesting, right? Because then it could be uh, the agent is forming today beliefs about uh, future agents that may be marginal, uh, you know, in the future, which may not be the same agents that are marginal today, and things like that. Okay, so we got this. Um, now, about this modeling of subjective beliefs, right? So how should we go about this? Um, a common criticism of non-rational expectations model is that you know, you're just inducing, introducing a lot of, uh, or additional degrees of freedom, maybe you know, reverse engineering, just these beliefs from asset price and so on. Um, and you know, once you give up the discipline of rational expectations model where objective reality pins down these expectations, you're sort of in an anything, anything goes uh, world, and and you know maybe this is not all that useful in terms of getting really models that make uh, that make actual uh, predictions rather than just reverse engineering. And I think you know this is a a, a critique one should take serious. Um, my personal view on this that is that you know one has to counter this with what is basically the scientific approach, which is you need to treat beliefs of investors as an object of scientific study. Uh, you know, with empirical rigorous surveys, looking at microdata on investment decisions, maybe experiments and field and lab and so on, to figure out, you know, so, some, some, some basic patterns about how these beliefs uh, move over time and then use these findings to uh, uh, basically discipline uh, the assumptions that you're making in, in asset pricing models about the dynamics of these beliefs. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's actually a chance here of, of you know, you know, we're deviating from the footsteps of the rational expectations literature where, you know, it often actually has taken that route of reverse engineering. Uh, so basically looking at asset prices and then trying to figure out um, you know, what sort of tweak to, to utility or to technology uh, could fit these asset prices. I don't think we should follow this, this approach for subjective belief dynamics. And instead, I think we should indeed look at data sources other than asset prices uh, to try to understand uh, uh, how to model uh, subjective beliefs. Yeah? This is, of course, far from simple. And, you know, the data is going to point in lots of different directions. But uh, I think we should give this a try. We have a okay. quick question yep. step uh -huh. from uh, yep. Gabriela Stockler. Gabriela, do you want to ask your question directly? Uh, hi. Uh, yes, uh, sure. Thank you. So um, in this, uh, the model that we're seeing right now about subjective beliefs, should we be, yep. th be thinking about large investors like institutional ones or more like individual investors and how does this map to uh, the evidence that you have that yeah. you have in mind? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So 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 it's a great question. The data that I'm going to show you now is actually on individual investors. Um, I I think you know individual investors are relevant. It kind of depends on the question that you're looking at. If you're looking at the question, you know trying to understand the, the valuation of the aggregate stock market, I think individuals are important because uh, individuals direct a lot of flows into you know, vehicles, investment vehicles that have a constrained asset allocation. So there are lots of you know, equity funds that can invest in nothing else than equities, lots of bond funds that can invest in nothing else than bonds. And a lot of the flows are directed actually by individuals and the institutional managers then have the choice of what to do within these asset classes, but, but they don't make the allocation between asset classes. Um, so I think individuals are relevant, but 
they are certainly not the only group. And I think it's also important to study, uh, you know, beliefs of, of, uh, of, of institutional investors, professional forecasters, and so on. So there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done. Uh, and then also trying to understand how this then maybe all fits together, maybe in a heterogeneous beliefs framework or something, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so what I'm going to show you is individuals, but keep in, in the back of your mind that uh, this is kind of a partial picture and there are other types of agents that one should also consider. Um, if one is looking at a different asset market, so let's say, suppose you were to look at the you know, mortgage-backed securities market or something, I guess, uh, maybe you know, individual investor expectations, they would probably be less relevant than in the equity market. Uh, that would at least be my, my sort of guess. Yeah. Anything else, Alexei, or shall I go on? Let's keep going. Yep. Okay, okay so um, I'm going to show you now uh, a series of individual investor uh, subjective return expectations. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of the you know, data sources and everything, but we basically, Jing Zhu and I, in a, in a recent paper, pieced together a whole bunch of different sources of uh, rich surveys. Um, some of them have direct measures of one year expected returns on a stock market. Um, uh, some of them have kind of coarser qualitative measures where people say, you know, I believe the stock market is going to go up, it's going to go down. And we have some statistical way of extracting percentage expectations from these, uh, from these uh, uh, more qualitative uh, surveys. And what we get in terms of time series looks like this. This is the blue line. You can see the data starts in the 70s. We have some old, so we found some old surveys in the 70s. And then there's a gap until 1986 where we have no data so far. And then it continues until now. Yeah. And just for a comparison, I have, and this is by the way expressed as the expected excess return. So this is, you can interpret the blue line as, as the subjective equity premium uh, that these individual investors seem to perceive at a given point in time. And the red line is what you get uh, in a predictive regression when you regress realized returns on the price dividend ratio, what you basically get as the fitted value, as the predicted equity premium from that, from that regression. And you can see, for example, you know, standard fact in these kinds of predictive regressions that in the, around the year 2000, you know, at the height of the, the, the tech bubble, there was uh, uh, a very low equity premium according to these predictive regressions. It was kind of around zero. Um, and in contrast, in the depth of the financial crisis, you know, it went up uh, quite a bit. Uh, and what's kind of interesting is to see the contrast between these series uh, at the time when a predictive reg regression told you that expected returns are really, really low, uh, but investors, individual investors, kept telling in these services that they expect a, a very high return going forward. Uh, it was kind of the opposite during the financial crisis. So their return expectations were somewhat pessimistic. And, and uh, 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 when, when a predictive regression actually gave you relatively high uh, predicted returns. Yeah. So again, you know, the, there are other types of investors. There are other you know, data sources that one should maybe also bring in, professional investors and so forth. But uh, all I want to point out here is that there is the potential for a wedge in, in, in beliefs here between what individuals expect and what an econometrician would sort of uh, tease out from the data as an expected uh, return. There is potentially a, a large time varying uh, wedge between these, between these series. Uh, and the, the question is, how could one reconcile this uh, within a model? Okay. So if you want to model uh, subjective beliefs, and maybe ones that kind of match some basic patterns in, in series like these here, what sort of choices do we have there, right? So um, there's a bunch of things we have to think about. Uh, one is, uh, you know, how do we think about the agent's memory? Uh, when the agent sees data, you know, how is this going to affect future decisions? To, is memory kept forever? Uh, does it get lost over time? Um, 
if the agent has some variable observations in memory, how is the data processed? Is there some biases in the processing or, or you know, is the data being processed in kind of Bayesian way? Um, and this, you know, links into what we discussed about the law of iterated expectations. How is the agent forming beliefs about future agents' beliefs? Uh, does the agent think future beliefs form the future agents form beliefs in the same way as she does, or something else? Uh, you know, is there belief heterogeneity, and so forth? Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you now one one model, um, plus a little bit additional motivating uh, evidence first. I'm going to show you one model where uh, memory of an agent is actually fading over time. And we're going to show you some empirical evidence for this that kind of motivated uh, this assumption. Given the memory that the agent has, we're going to assume that the processing of the data is perfectly rational, right? So there, there may be this loss of memory, but what, for whatever data is still stored in memory, the processing is, is in a rational basing way. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that this is exactly the right way of modeling it, but uh, we basically wanted to take an approach where we only tweak one aspect of, uh, you know, kind of one, one aspect away from the full memory standard Bayesian learning model. And so the only tweak that leads away from it is basically just fading memory. Yeah? But in terms of the processing of the data, the agent is going to be Bayesian. Um, what about views about the future agent beliefs? Um, so there we're going to assume that the agent is also rational in the sense that the agent anticipates that an agent pricing the asset in the future is going to have suffered some memory loss. Yeah? And uh, then we can also talk about what this means for the law of iterated expectations. And there's not going to be any belief heterogeneity. Um, we're going to take a homogeneous belief setting as an approximation of what you get as the average beliefs in a heterogeneous investor setting where heterogeneous investors learn from experience. And I'll, I'll be more precise about what exactly I mean uh, with this. Yeah? But uh, we're not thinking of this as necessarily the exact truth, but uh, hopefully as a useful approximation. Um, you know, wh why do we do this? Well, because homogeneous beliefs models are much easier to work with, and there's lots of things we can do with them that are kind of difficult with heterogeneous agent uh, models. But of course, you know, future research could, could try to, uh, uh, um, you know, make this more fancy and maybe bring in some heterogeneity as, as, as well. Okay, so as a background, let me first talk a little bit for a few minutes about, about Bayesian learning in that kind of environment uh, that we are going to consider here. And then we can see what, this fading memory tweak is that we make to that to that standard Bayesian learning uh, framework. Yeah. So the first few minutes are going to be a little bit of detour just uh, to to set the stage uh, and explain a little bit how the Bayesian learning uh, works in this setting here. Okay. So imagine an, an investor who is observing uh, log dividend growth, and the investor knows that. Uh, the law of motion is like this, you know, it's very simple IID shocks, and there's this constant mean mu. But the agent's problem is that the agent doesn't know. So unlike, doesn't know mu. So unlike in a rational expectations model, the agent is not endowed uh, from the beginning with knowledge of this mu. The agent has to try to infer it from observed data. Okay. Now, how would this play out in a Bayesian uh, learning uh, setting. So if an agent started with uninformative prior beliefs, so you know, a, a diffuse prior, then at least in terms of the posterior mean here, things are extremely simple. The posterior mean of an agent would just be the equal weighted average of whatever uh, you know, dividend growth observations the agent has observed until time t. Yeah, so I'm going to call this mu, mu hat uh, t. 
And one thing that I'm going to use now uh, is, is uh, basically a recursive representation of, uh, of a sample mean that's going to be uh, useful and what's going to come up soon. And so let me just note, and you can try this for yourself, that you can write this mu hat t also you know, numerically identical in as sort of a recursive updating scheme where you take, you get mu hat t by taking mu hat t minus one and updating this uh, with this updating term here. And you can see this updating term takes the most recent dividend growth observations, compares it to the estimate from the prior period and then updates this, this mu hat t in the direction of this, in a way, surprise, right? And so if dividend growth comes out higher than this mu hat t minus one, then the agent is gonna move mu, t, mu, mu hat t a little bit uh, in this direction of that surprise. How much does the agent move it? Well, this is governed by one over t here. This is very intuitive, one over t, one over the size of the data set that the agent has. So the larger the data set is that the agent has seen already, the less a new surprise will influence that posterior mean, right? It's kind of natural. Once the agent has seen a lot of data, one additional observation doesn't add a lot of information. And so the posterior mean gets less and less sensitive uh, to a new observation, right? okay? And so if you, if you just iterate on this, uh, you, you basically just end up getting exactly exactly this, yeah? the, this, this, this sample mean. This is just a different way of writing this, okay? Now, um, this kind of updating scheme, once you write this in this recursive way, is often also called a decreasing gain updating scheme, where the gain is this one over t here, right? And this is decreasing over time. Uh, and so this is updating with a decreasing, decreasing gain. Okay, so this is how this looks like for, for, this, for this very simple IID law of motion. Um, how would this look like when you have persistence? So let's say we look, for example, at inflation, which is a, would be a, you know, a, a plausible sort of law of motion for inflation would be at least you know, in many decades that there is some persistence in there, right? So where inflation at time t plus one, uh, you know, relates to inflation at time t with some, some persistence, how would uh, this, this, an updating scheme for the posterior mean look like for this, for this persistent process? Um, well, if we again start with uninformative prior beliefs, based on updating basically amounts to running an OLS regression of uh, time t plus one inflation on inflation at time t, uh, including a constant, and then you estimate basically these two OLS coefficients. And for OLS, there is again a recursive representation of this. So if you collect these OLS coefficients in this B, and you collect the variables in the regression, the constant, and the lagged inflation rate in X, then you can write uh, these OLS coefficients in terms of a recursive updating scheme where you take the coefficients estimated in the last period and you move them in the direction of uh, the recent surprise. So this is current inflation relative to the fitted value from the prior period. And how much you move them, again, depends on a, on a, on a, on a gain, again, one over T here, right? So. Again, if you have more and more data assembled already, one more observation is going to move these estimates or that posterior mean less and less. And the only you know, real difference here to our simple mean from the previous slide is that we have this, our inverse matrix here. And that's basically just like your you know, X prime X inverse matrix that you always have in OLS. And this one is also following a recursive updating scheme here. Yeah? Okay, it would be tedious, but you could work through all of these recursions, you know, iterate through, and you would basically end up with the OLS uh, estimator. Yeah? It's just nothing else than writing an OLS estimator recursively. Yeah? But this is how you can very nicely implement learning schemes where 
for example, if you have agents that you assume are running or less regressions to form beliefs, you can use these updating formulas to basically every period update agents' expectations based on new observations that they see in the current period. Yeah. This is why these, these expressions are kind of very, very useful. Okay, and now with this as a background, I wanna spend a few minutes talking about some empirical work that Ulrike Malmendi and I did uh, several years ago, where we studied how investors form beliefs about future inflation based on observations that they collect uh, during their lifetimes. Yeah? And what, what sort of you know, motivated this, this, uh, this line of research is that we thought it's kind of maybe not so plausible that individual uh, agents are you know, aware of the entire historical record of data that exists out there and that they are influenced necessarily as strongly by some, some data that just exists in the history books uh, as opposed to data that they have actually seen themselves uh, during their own lifetimes and maybe especially data that they have seen recently uh, during their own lifetimes. Okay, and so um, we basically tried to investigate this learning from experiment hypothesis, which roughly speaking means that people are kind of trying to learn in a, in a sort of Bayesian way, um, but uh, you know, memory is decaying and historical data carries less weight uh, if it's not personally uh, experienced. Yeah, and uh, we had one paper uh, that looked at asset return experiences and then looked at how this correlates with people's uh, portfolio choices and stock return expectations. And we had another paper on inflation experiences where we had uh, you know, a lot of beliefs data that I'm gonna show you now on inflation expectations. And we show how this relates to people's uh, lifetime experiences uh, of inflation. Stefan, we, we have a yep. question uh, uh -huh. from Roy about heteroskedasticity. Roy, would you like to jump in and ask it? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, my question is, uh, when you're looking at Bayesian updating in gang, if the observation noise were heteroskedastic, then the gang would be time varying as well, right? That is that is right. Or I guess this not also depends on what the agent is learning about that heteroskedasticity or whether the agent knows what the process looks like. My guess is, I haven't thought about this carefully, but my guess is that if, if the agent knows the process and can basically every period form a conditional expectation, you would probably end up with something that looks like this here, but with these surprises standardized by, by, uh, uh, by conditional, conditional volatility. Um, but uh, but I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't carefully looked at this. So, so this is just a guess at this point. If the agent doesn't know exactly how that heteroskedasticity looks like and has to learn about it, then of course things get a lot more complicated. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, and so the reason why I showed you now earlier this um, recursive updating scheme for OLS estimation is because one can now bring in this, this idea about learning from experience uh, with a very simple tweak to this updating scheme that I showed you earlier, right? This one here. And so the, the only tweak that we basically make here is to this gain, right? So in, in, in just OLS, this would be one over T, one over the sample size that's available at time T. Um, and we can make a simple tweak to this. So instead of, uh, making that gain a function of t, we make it a function of t minus s. And what is s? s in our notation is the birth date of a cohort. So t minus s is basically the age of the agent, or in other words, the size of a lifetime data set that an agent has, yeah. if you started at birth. You know, in, in the paper, we go through a lot of uh, uh, checks where we look at, you know, what happens when you start um, uh, learning at, you know, at, at age 18 or something like this. 
it turns out it you know all, all of this doesn't really matter uh, all that much so for simplicity just think of people learning from their lifetime data set that starts that starts at birth so p minus s is the h and the gain is now a function of h so this means when the h is young the gain is high and a new observation is going to have a strong influence on agent beliefs because as a young person the lifetime data set assembled so far is small and so the marginal effect of a new observation is big when an agent gets older and has a large lifetime experience data set then a new observation carries less weight right it, it moves it will move also beliefs uh, less okay so this is one tweak and then the other tweak is that in the numerator, there's not a one, but there's a parameter theta. And what this does is that it, it, it allows potentially for uh, downweighting of observations early on life. So if the, the agents are being influenced more by you know, experiences that happen recently, as opposed to very early in life, then that parameter theta can capture this. And I can kind of show you how this how this looks like if we look at the implied weights. So if you if you you know run this updating scheme with with that kind of gain uh, for an individual, let's say an individual who is uh, fifty years old, what are the implied weights on the data in the agent's lifetime data set? Yeah. And so you can see with theta equals one. This is the blue line, uh, and on the x-axis, these are basically the, the is the time lag of observations. So the current observation is over here at zero, and observations at birth are on the right hand side, uh, you know, 200 quarters, 50 years. And so with with a theta equals one, it would just be equal weighting. This would just mean the agent is running OLS on the lifetime data set, yeah, just weighting every observation equally. Um, what the data from the Michigan Survey of Consumers on Inflation Expectations uh, basically tells us is that the weights kind of look like this red line. So we get a, an, an actual estimate of theta that is very close to three. And this gives you this red line. And so this means kind of plausibly uh, low weights on, expect, on, on observations early in life and higher weights on, expect, on, on observations that happened uh, very recently. But um, in our estimation, we also you know, allow for potentially you know, weights that, that are higher early in life. You know, there are some, some stories that say early life experiences are particularly, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, have a strong influence. We also experimented in some robustness check with some hump shapes. So maybe, maybe there's a hump around early adult uh, you know, years. There are some, some psychological theories that say uh, what happens in your early adult life is particularly uh, forming, but uh, we didn't really find any, any, any evidence of that. So it's, it's the, the, the weights given by this red line approximately that kind of work best. Okay, let me show you what we get with this. Uh, and then we can circle back to, to thinking about asset pricing uh, and think about how we could use a belief formation mechanism like this uh, in an asset pricing setting. Okay, so uh, what this plot shows you is uh, data, first focus on, on the, the diamonds, the dots, and so on, not on the lines. Um, these are the, the raw data from the Michigan Survey of Consumers for inflation expectations starting in the 1950s, going until 2010. This is what we used in the paper back then. And what the chart shows you is the expected inflation of different age groups relative to the cross-sectional mean at every point in time. So we just want to focus not on you know, time variation overall, but just on cross-sectional differences between different cohorts. And so I subtracted basically the cross-sectional mean from every observation here yeah, at every point in time. And so what, what, is, what, is, what this shows you is that you know, in the 1950s and 60s, different age groups did not have a lot of differences in their inflation expectations. But in the 1970s, which was a period when inflation rates in the US started going up, there was a gap opening up between younger people 
uh, below 40, here are the black ones. And older people above 60, these are the blue ones. And you can see this gap kept growing until in around 1981, there was about a three percentage point gap in the between the expectations of younger people and, and the expectations of older people. So younger people expected about three percentage points higher inflation expectations at that point, uh, had, had about three percentage points higher inflation expectations than younger people, uh, than older people. And then this gap narrowed very slowly until the mid 90s. And then most recently in the 2000s, this gap, you know, although small in magnitude, but the gap had kind of reverted. So in the 2000s, it was the older people that they had the higher inflation expectations uh, and the younger people had lower inflation expectations. Okay. okay. So this is the raw data. Um, what the lines show you is what you get from uh, this simple updating scheme. If you apply this you know, updating scheme that we discussed with these gains and picking a, a theta of around three, which gives you an implied weighting like this shown by the red line. If you apply this to every cohort and let every cohort basically learn from their lifetime experience in this way and let them update their beliefs at every point in time, then you get the implied beliefs shown by these lines here. And you can see, you know, it's not perfect, but it goes quite a long way in explaining where this gap comes from between younger people and older people. It also matches the closing of the gap. And then importantly, also the reversion of this gap in, in the 2000s. Yeah. Okay. And um, just here is a, a little out of sample piece of evidence from the New York Fed Survey of Consumer Expectations uh, just for the last years after the end of this sample here, right? So we ended here still with a gap between young and old. And our, our model actually predicts that this gap should have continued for many years after. Um, and this is also what you, what you see uh, in, in the New York Fed Survey. So the brownish uh, line here is uh, older people. And you can see relative to the younger people, blue line, it was kind of persistently in most periods about you know, one percentage point higher or so uh, in, a, in the last uh, seven, eight years uh, uh, throughout this period. Okay, now what is basically going on on the line here? We can look at this by looking at the implied AR coefficient uh, uh, estimates and, and also the implied long run mean of inflation, right? So when, when, we, when we run this recursive updating scheme, this AR1 regression recursively updated for every cohort at every point in time, then we get at every point in time, we get basically every cohort's view about what they think the AR coefficient is in that model. And we can also calculate from the fitted AR model what they think long-run inflation, uh, you know, the long-run mean is going to be. Yeah. And so you can see what, what basically happened is in the 1970s, as inflation rates were starting to go up and be more persistent, it was particularly young people that updated towards inflation being very highly persistent more so than older people whose estimates were not moving that much because they had already seen a longer lifetime data. And so their uh, estimates were not so sensitive uh, to these new uh, highly persistent inflation observations. Yeah. And then the opposite happened in the 2000s where younger people adjusted quickly to the fact that inflation is not persistent anymore. While young, older people are still carrying the memory of the 70s and so there was, a, there was basically less of a decline uh, there. Yeah? So this is one, one, one part of the answer of what's going on here. And the other one is just the, the long run mean. So again, younger people updated more strongly in their long run mean beliefs to, uh, to these reasonably high inflation observations. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, exactly sort of in the reverse in the 2000s where they updated more quickly to the, the low inflation rates that we had seen in recent, in recent decades. Yeah. And these two things together, the AR coefficient and this sort of implied belief about a long run mean, uh, 
this is what basically gives rise to this, these patterns, uh, this gap between these, these lines uh, implied by the model. Yeah. Stefan, do you, do you have any thoughts on why it seems to have updated more on the way up uh, in your next slide um, than on the way down? It just took, or the one after that, it seems to have taken much longer for that to come back down, even though actual inflation actually ramped up more slowly than it came down. Um, or at least was more symmetric. Ah, uh, I mean it's not it's not it's not huge. So if you look at this, it's like 81 from kind of 65 to 81, like 16 years. And from here, yeah, I guess it's not a huge difference. I think it must be driven by the fact that the rise in inflation was a little steeper than than the coming down. You know, I mean it didn't go down right away to two percent, right? It was we still had in the 80s. The occasion of four percent floating around, uh, so I think that's that's what's going on. Okay, so what what I showed you so far was all about heterogeneity, right? Um, but the heterogeneity there, to some extent, was also just uh, uh, you know empirically useful for identifying a belief formation. Uh, uh, mechanism. There's of course also lots of co-movement in these expectations that I haven't shown you, uh, but but all of these expectations are of course you know moving over time together as well. Um, uh, what I've shown you in these in these plots was the, how these cross-sectional differences move over time. Um, but when we go to asset pricing, it's it's uh, sort of you know useful to think about whether maybe we can what the potential effects on asset prices might be of these two things, right? On the one hand, you have fading memory over time. This affects all Asians, you know, uh, uh, young and old, you know, to different degrees, but it's going on for everybody. And then there are these cross-sectional differences. And so for asset pricing, you could ask, if you want to build an asset pricing model with this kind of belief formation mechanism, um, you know, which of these is going to have the uh, biggest influence on, on asset prices. Uh, are these cross-sectional differences uh, all that important? And what we basically try to do is to, 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 to uh, in the model that I'm gonna show you, is to see how far we get if we, you know, basically abstract from these cross-sectional differences, but just focus on this fading memory uh, aspect over time. Yeah. And before we can do that, it would be useful to characterize how sort of fading memory looks like for the average agent. Right? So what I've shown you so far is how every cohort updates, but it would be nice if we could figure out how the belief of the average agent kind of evolves over time. And then we can approximately at least think of a representative agent setting where we, you know, given a representative agent, these average beliefs right? with no claim, of course, that is necessarily uh, you know, uh, representing the equilibrium that you would get in a in a in a in an economy where you take into account the full heterogeneity, but you can at least see uh, how far we get with this with this approximation, right? And so let's think about these uh, average belief dynamics, right? So if you if you take all of these cohorts and every point in time take a cross-sectional average of the belief, how does this cross-sectional average belief uh, uh, look like. Yeah? And so what, what Ulrich and I showed in our 2016 paper is that the average belief can be very closely approximated by a constant, constant gain learning algorithm. Yeah? So it's kind of interesting, right? Every cohort is learning with decreasing gain. The gain is decreasing with age, right? As agents get older, they update less strongly to a new surprise. But of course, at every point in time, there are some younger people in the economy, there are some older people in the economy. And so when you take a cross-sectional average, you're always averaging across this you know, demographic you know, you know, age distribution. And unless you get, you know, want to take into account changes in, 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 in the age distribution or you know, age and wealth distribution or something like this over time, but if you do, do this just a simple averaging across these cohorts, you basically get a belief that looks like a constant gain updating scheme. Yeah. 
because at every point in time, there's always young people, there's always old people. And uh, we looked at this, for example, uh, by checking how the weights look like. So if you look at uh, these cohorts all individually and you ask how much weight do they put on average on past observations, you get this, this blue line and you can see, you know, of course this is declining as it goes back in time. There are two things going on. Every agent is, has a, you know, uh, is putting decreasing weights on, on distant observation in their own lifetime data sets. And then on top of that, uh, you know, some generations, some codes totally disappear and their weights basically go to zero. And so the combined effect of this is what is shown by the blue line here. And then the red dash line is the weights that you would get from a constant gain updating scheme that we try to fit closely uh, to this blue line here. And you can see this is, this is very close. So for all basically practical purposes, we can approximate what's happening to the average belief in this, in this setting with a constant gain uh, updating scheme. Yeah, and so let me show you how this looks like in the time series. Uh, so the, uh, the circles are the actual uh, cross-sectional averages of uh, inflation expectations in the Michigan survey of consumers. Uh, the red line is the average belief at every point in time from this learning from experience framework where every cohort learns from experience. And then the blue line that sits almost exactly on top of it is what you get from the best fitting constant gain learning algorithm. Yeah? When, we, when we try to pick a constant gain learning with a gain that's you know, picked to make it close to the red line, uh, then, then that's what you get. And you can see this, this sits very closely uh, on top of each other. Okay, and so now looking back to, you know, as a pricing, if we want to introduce fading, this fading memory uh, idea into as a pricing, it seems like a useful starting point to think about a representative agent that's learning with a constant gain. Yeah. And we can, we can um, take the evidence here uh, from this paper, but you know, our, our earlier QJA paper also speaks to that evidence. Um, we can take, take uh, to, to this point, we, we can take the evidence here uh, to inform us about what sort of gain is empirically plausible. Yeah? And I'll, I'll come back to this. Okay, so just to summarize uh, quickly before we go on, um, learning from lifetime experience at the individual level basically translates approximately to constant gain loading in, you know, for, for, for the average individual's belief. Okay. And the gain that we estimated that matches these inflation expectations survey data is uh, 0.018. So what does this mean? This means when a new quarterly surprise of inflation comes in, the agent puts 1.8% weight on this new observation and the rest on the previous estimate from the previous quarter. Yeah. Okay. And um, we also did some calculations with, with this in our earlier QJA paper and we found that for explaining uh, people's portfolio choices, you actually you know, get a pretty similar uh, uh, implied uh, degree of fading memory as well. So this is also consistent with, with that, at least roughly. Okay, and so now I'm gonna show you how to apply this belief formation mechanism to learning about long-run dividend growth by a representative investor. And so basically making this approximation of saying, okay, let's ignore heterogeneity, let's focus on a representative investor that's learning with a, with a constant gain. And this is based on a joint paper with Zhang Yang Xu who is, that's uh, forthcoming in the RFS. Okay. Um, all right, so let's think about uh, learning with constant gain. So we're going to think about the representative investor now who is uh, looking at you know, stock payout or dividend growth and knows that it's IRD with some mean mu d, 
and some uh, epsilon. Uh, and I think I forgot a sigma here. So later, I think I'm going to have a have sigma epsilon here. Uh, so this may be a typo. Okay, and the um, investor is going to learn about uh, this mu d with constant gains. So we, we're we're going to get something uh, later that kind of is going to look like this. Before I show you the full machinery, we're first going to do again some sort of simple uh, uh, calculations with this, and then introduce the full machinery uh, later. So I'll show you later that you get to something like this with something that looks very close to kind of standard Bayesian Bayesian learning in this setting, uh, just with a little tweak. Yeah. But uh, for now, let's just focus directly on a you know, specify this directly as as constant gain learning. So uh, the estimate at t plus one of the agent is formed by taking the time t estimate and then updating in the direction of the surprise. And the gain is now this new parameter. And for everything that I'm going to show you today, we're going to fix this new parameter at this 1.8% value that uh, we, we basically obtained from the, from the microdata. Yeah? So this is kind of in the spirit of what I said earlier, which is when we introduce belief dynamics, subjective belief dynamics into asset pricing models, we may not want to just you know, introduce three parameters here that we could tweak to match asset prices. It would be useful to have them pinned down by some data other than asset prices uh, and then see how far we get and whether we can reconcile uh, what we see in the survey data with you know, what we need to, to uh, get, get a good asset pricing model rather than just treating this new as a free parameter. Yeah? So in, in everything I'm gonna show you, we're, we're going to tie our hands to set this to 1.8%. Okay, so before we look at the full machinery, let's go back to our Campbell-Schiller uh, present value identity. So we're gonna keep our uh, assumption from before of a constant risk premium and the constant risk free rate. And then what I did here is just to restate again this equation of four that we had earlier. If you recall, this was we figured out that in the subjective beliefs model with constant risk premium, constant risk free rate, the return uh, depends on uh, basically the surprise of dividends, dividend growth relative to the agent's expectation at time t, and then some action potentially from changes in future beliefs relative to uh, current beliefs. Right? So for example, if the agent becomes more optimistic in the future relative to the current degree of op optimism, this would raise future asset prices and would give rise to a positive return. Okay, and now we have a specific model of belief dynamics now, right? This, this updating scheme. And so we cannot just plug this in. Uh, so the, the uh, this is just this, this constant gain, gain, gain scheme from the previous slide. And if you plug this in here, uh, we get a very simple uh, relation. So you know anything that happens to uh, beliefs here is, is tied to these uh, updating surprises. And so we now get a return that's basically just a constant the constant uh, risk rate plus risk premium plus a surprise term, right? So, so the agent's surprise about, about cash flows and, and uh, uh, this gets multiplied by, by this factor here. And you can see how the gain here plays an important role, right? So if the, if the gain is bigger, this means the agent is going to react more aggressively to in, in, in updating of, this, uh, of the beliefs about his new is going to react more aggressively to a surprise. And since the agent reacts more aggressively, there's gonna be a bigger return than associated with this. Yeah. Okay, and now we can, can again ask with, with this specific model of belief dynamics, we can again ask, how does this look like to an outside uh, econometrician observer? 
So let's take objective expectations, time t, objective expectation of this. I also brought the risk-free rate on the left-hand side to express this as a, as a risk premium. And then we get, you know, maybe just the only thing that happens is we take expectations of this here, which becomes the objective expectation of the dividend. And so then we see that the subjective risk premium, sorry, the objective risk premium from the viewpoint of the econometrician is the subjective risk premium that the agent thinks they have priced in the asset plus a term that reflects the econometrician's basically superior knowledge of the data generating process. Right? So the true mu d, the wedge of the true mu d relative to the agent's subjective beliefs about that long run dividend growth rate. And again, the stronger the agent reacts to a surprise, uh, the higher the gain, the more relevant, the bigger this term uh, is going to be. Okay, but now with this specific model of belief dynamics, we now see that there is um, going to be time varying risk premia from the viewpoint of the econometrician. Yeah? Because this is a constant here, but this is going to vary over time depending on what kind of realizations of dividends the agent is going to see. Yeah? If the agent observes a string of high dividend growth observations, the agent is going to be optimistic about future dividend growth. And then this wedge is going to be negative, which reflects the fact that relative to the objective law of motion or relative to objective beliefs, prices are too high and are going to come down uh, in the future. And so this shows up as a low expected return under objective probabilities. Okay. We could also figure out a subjective expectations error um, if we compare these objective expectations of the econometrician to the agent's subjective beliefs. And that's basically the same thing. It's just that we took out the subjective risk premium here, right? So the agent just believes returns are this, uh, you know, expect the returns are this. Uh, more precisely, the expected risk premium is just this theta. The econometrician knows it's this whole thing. And so the difference between the two is the subjective expectations error that we have here. And that one is also predictable, right? So, so at least from the viewpoint of the econometrician endowed with a large sample, so that the econometrician effectively knows this true uh, uh, mean dividend growth rate, uh, the subjective expectation error is going to be predictable. Okay, so it would be nice to empirically implement this, right? Uh, these are some very simple relationships that tell us there should be some predictability here. We should be able to predict returns uh, using this, uh, you know, agent belief about dividend growth. And this agent belief about dividend growth is based on a very simple updating scheme, constant gain updating. We can recreate this in a data and then check to see whether this actually predicts returns. Okay, that's sort of an empirical issue a little bit. You know, when we run these predictive regressions now, we would like to do them on a long sample, right? Because predict, uh, figuring out predictability is always going to be statistically sort of a shaky uh, exercise a little bit. So if you only had a few decades of data, that's not going to work very well. You don't have a lot of statistical power. So it would be nice to, to, to do this with a sample that goes back to the start of CRISP in the 1920s. But if you want to start the, a predictive regression with some new tilde D uh, in, let's say, 1926, then you need already decades of dividend data before that in order to construct this uh, new tilde D, right? And so um, the CRISP dividend series is not going to do that. And so we augmented this with a bunch of other data series. So we, we uh, used the usual CRISP uh, dividend series uh, and, uh, from 1926 
And then we have some dividend data from Piketty et al. from earlier periods, from some economic historian uh, uh, from an even earlier period. And then for the uh, very early period from 1871 to 1900, we are approximating dividend growth with GDP growth. Um, this doesn't really play much of a role because the, with this 1.8% gain, the observations that end in 1900 don't carry much weight in 1926. So, so you know, it doesn't really matter all that much what you what you put in here. But um, but these ones are more important. Yeah. Okay, we also adjusted uh, the uh, crisp uh, dividends for repurchases, but that's really only something that matters starting from the 1990s, 1990s onwards because there were no, no, you know, repurchases kind of in the earlier period. Okay, and so we, we then just use this dividend growth series over this long, uh, over this long sample. And then we just apply this recursive updating scheme to calculate uh, this mutual D at every point in time using this gain of 1.8%. Um, and then we can use those to predict excess returns on a crisp valuated index. Yeah, so with a quarterly regression, um, doing some bias adjustment and you know, bootstrap to get a p-value, the paper has uh, all of the details on this, but we basically get a negative coefficient. Um, and just let me go back to the prediction, right? The negative coefficient is exactly what, what we would expect to find here. I mean, the agent has seen a string of high dividend growth observations, asset prices should be high and future returns low. Yeah, and that's basically what we find. Uh, in the data. We can also use our uh, this survey expectation series that I showed you earlier to calculate survey expectations errors by comparing the expectation that individuals had at a given point in time to the actual realization of returns over that forecast horizon. And then you know uh, look at the difference as the subjective expectation error. And the prediction here would be that, let me just go back again. The prediction would be that we get a negative coefficient. Um, and that's also what we find. Okay. And so this is sort of a preliminary data exercise to inform a little bit about what sort of things, uh, what sort of moments we would like to see a model uh, now to match, right? Of course, we also want to target you know, the average equity premium and, and other things, but we also want to match these uh, predictability uh, of returns and predictability of uh, expectations errors uh, with the model. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just one more plot, and then we'll, we'll take a break. Um, this is just showing you what you get from this predictive regression um, in terms of now five year. Uh, predicted excess returns and the uh, contrasted with the actual five-year excess returns over that over that prediction horizon. Yeah? So just to pick out a few uh, observations here. So for example, in in uh, in the Great Depression, uh, you know, dividend growth was very poor, and so the story would would tell you that uh, agents were pessimistic at the time. Uh, future returns should be high. And that's basically what the red line is here, the prediction. And you can see, you know, returns during that, that time were also relatively high. Uh, kind of the opposite in the late 1990s, dividend growth had been relatively good uh, for, for quite a while. And uh, asset prices should be high, future returns low. This is also kind of what happened. And then again, the opposite in the financial crisis uh, uh, before 2010 there. All right, Alexis, shall we take a break here for 10 minutes? Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, seems but like maybe if there are any questions, good. we can do those, those first, huh? Um, right now we're good on the questions, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe after the break, if, if, if some pile up. Sounds good. Um, okay, let's yeah. do okay. 10 minutes. And so yeah. we'll come back at 10.40. Yep, Thanks, okay. Guys.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, Stefan, we do have a, a few questions here that have piled up um, <laughs> during the break. So let's see, uh, Tyler has a question. Tyler, are you here to, to ask your question live? Tyler might not be back yet. Let's see, how about Roy? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Oh, um, so uh, my question is, because the um, the new of the representative agent is being driven by the cross-sectional sort of demographics of the cohorts, would it be possible to use time variation of this cross-section to potentially capture time variation in new of the representative agent? Uh, yeah, in principle, yes. Uh, I think the challenge there is a little bit the data, right? So for um, recent years in, you know, the, the, since 1989, the survey of consumer finances, for example, gives you a pretty good view on the wealth distribution by age, for example. And you could, for example, use that to 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 um, to construct some sort of you know shifting demographics uh, weights. But uh, before that, it doesn't look uh, like you. There's good data for 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 doing that. Uh, uh, so it's not to say one, one can't do it, but maybe with some more assumptions. There's certainly, you know, data on the age distribution, like how many people you have in different uh, age groups, but you would probably also want to combine this with some information on wealth. Thank you. Uh, let's see, um, Matt Kelly. Matt, are you here? Feel free to jump in and ask your question. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, my question is, do, do these biases and subjective versus objective expected returns due to memory and learning imply some arbitrage opportunity? It sounds like the econometrician could stand to make a lot of money in mm -hmm. this uh, model. Yeah, it's a good question. So first, to be clear about you know terminology, it would definitely not be an arbitrage opportunity, right? An arbitrage opportunity would be something that's riskless. Um, if the econometrician builds a model here to forecast returns, which in a large sample would be possible, uh, the competition would still have to take quite a lot of risk to run a market timing strategy here. So it would definitely not be riskless. Um, but could could an agent, uh, you know, potentially uh, make money, you know, at least in, in, in sort of a, uh, a, a relatively good risk adjusted uh, profit? Uh, the answer is yes, in a very large sample. But in practice, someone who would have to run an out of sample forecasting model, right? The, what the econometrician does in these predictive regressions that I'm showing uh, here is in sample, ex post after the fact. This is not out of sample. And in, the, in the, one of the last sections of the paper, we actually run an out of sample prediction exercise. And we ask, you know, with sort of a reasonable sample size, is there out of sample predictability in the model? And it actually turns out it's not. So you would need at least something like, I forgot the exact you know, cutoff where, where out of sample predictability starts to kick in, but it's something like a hundred years or so. Uh, so it's, it's um, predicting returns in this model, even though in sample, it looks like there's quite a bit of return predictability out of sample is actually very hard. Um, so, so there's no easy money on the table here. That's Thank you. Back. Um, mm -hmm. Tyler, you want to ask your question? Sure, thank you. Um, hi, I, I was just asking uh, if there's a version of this graph, Stephen, uh, where you have a third, like what I call a third line representing maybe a comparative rational expectations model or the ones you were contrasting with the beginning, in the beginning of the class where you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, rational expectation that mm -hmm. uses only the price data. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess the you can think of the red line here as a, you know, as what the belief, the agents of the beliefs would have to be to be consistent with rational expectations, right? So this is the objective forecast, at least if you condition on this, you know, uh, exponentially weighted dividend growth variable. Uh, this is the objective forecast. And so you would need a model that kind of maps into this. And so I think you could do this. You know, if you, if you probably take a habit formation model, uh, you would probably get quite close to this, 
But the key thing that would be different is the habit formation model would say that, for example, in the late 90s, people's beliefs should have been that returns going forward are low, right? And so uh, that would be the crucial difference. And, and that's, that's what's very different than a subjective beliefs model. The subjective belief model would say, no, return expectations at that point were not low. Uh, yeah, does it make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Anything There's else? one more question yeah. that, that just popped up. Uh, you, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. Um, oh, his internet is acting up a little bit again. Let me read it for him. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question on choosing the learning parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, I recall the evidence you gave showed a lot of cross-sectional differences in learning you then collapsed all heterogeneity into a single representative parameter in your model. This brings into question what the age of the marginal investor is and mm -hmm. what are your thoughts here? How do results mm -hmm. change if you use the learning parameters of an older age group instead? Mm -hmm. So that, that's a great question. And, you know, wealth weighted one might think a little bit uh, older might, might actually make sense. Um, the results are not very sensitive to this parameter. So, you know, you can pick something that is like, instead of 1.8%, you pick 1.3%. It still behaves quite uh, uh, similar. Uh, we have some robustness check in, I think in the online appendix where we vary that, that gain parameter. So uh, I don't quite know what a proper, you know, more weight on older people type of weighted gain estimate would be. But if you think about, you know, something like maybe 1.3 instead of 1.8, uh, one could look this up there uh, in, in these charts we have there about what this would do to the model. But uh, I don't recall on the top of my head exactly what, you know, I cannot give you a number on how, how the model changes, but it's, it's, not, it's not very sensitive to that. Okay, great. We can move mm -hmm. on. Okay. Then uh, let's now go beyond this reduced form stuff to actually look at an equilibrium asset pricing model. So we're gonna consider an endowment, very simple endowment economy, where we have a representative agent that loans with fading memory with this constant gain. Yeah? But uh, I'm going to derive now this constant gain learning a little bit more closely from, from a Bayesian learning uh, setting with, with just one tweak to the standard Bayesian learning setting. Yeah? Uh, the, the, advantage of doing this with the Bayesian machinery is that uh, in addition to you know, having some predictions about how the agent's uh, belief about the mean basically kind of evolves over time, we also get a model that gives us something about the agent's subjective uncertainty. And the Bayesian approach allows us to, to nicely capture this. And this could be potentially very important because you know, when an agent is learning with fading memory, this means that the agent at every point in time is always using essentially a rather limited data set, right? Because data kind of gets lost. And this means that at every point in time, the agent must have quite a lot of subjective uncertainty because there is not that much data in the agent's memory to inform these estimates. Yeah? And so uh, keeping track of that subjective uncertainty could actually be uh, quite important. And it is actually in this model very important for getting, for example, uh, the equity premium uh, to a reasonable value. Okay, so let's let's see how we do this. So very simple endowment economy with an IID endowment growth process. Um, and the agent's learning problem is to figure out mu. And for simplicity, we're going to assume that the agent knows the sigma, right? So the only problem is to learn is mu. And uh, the epsilon is a, is a standard normal shock. The agent is going to start with some, before seeing any data, right? Before even looking at one piece, the agent has some prior beliefs about what this mu might be. Uh, and they're centered out around mu zero and sigma squared zero. And then the agent combines observed data with the prior, right? So the, the prior is here and the observed data comes here into the likelihood and those together give the posterior uh, of the agent. And what you see here just looks like standard 
you know, Bayesian updating, uh, forming a Bayesian posterior with one tweak. And the tweak is here in the exponent. You can see there's a one minus nu here, raised to the power of j. Um, the way to think about this is j kind of grows as you go back in time. So observations, you know, in the more distant path are associated with a higher j. So for those observations, recall that nu is 1.8%. Is so for those observations with high j in a distant path, this term becomes closer and closer to zero, this exponent, right? Okay, and this is basically what inducing fading memory here. We are basically discounting terms in a likelihood associated with observations in a distant path more and more. The more they recede into the past, the more they get downweighted. Yeah? And that's the only deviation here from a full memory standard Bayesian learning model here. Yeah? And everything we do basically follows from, from that. Okay, and so what's also nice now is one can show if the agent starts with a diffuse prior, so let the prior variance go to, to infinity, the posterior is again just simple, the posterior, uh, you know, is such that the posterior mean it follows just again our simple constant gain learning updating scheme that we discussed before. Yeah? So in terms of the posterior mean, it's exactly what we already discussed before, just now here with endowment growth, instead of this, this dividend growth we had before. Um, but that's all, all the same. And now iterating on, we can also just iterate on this. And then this shows you that you can represent this posterior mean also as an exponentially weighted average of past endowment growth observations. Okay. It's just a different way of, instead of writing this recursively, you can write this out as, a, as an exponentially weighted, weighted average. Yeah. Okay. And uh, this now also gives us a little bit of a, a sort of a way to interpret this, this new parameter, which again, we set to 1.8%. Um, if you compare this constant gain updating scheme that we have here to what we discussed very early on today, about learning with OLS, right? With OLS, this was one over T was the gain, one over the sample size. So you can interpret this new kind of like, you know, one over, so you can interpret this, this, this new here kind of like one over the effective sample size. Yeah? Um, and so a new of 1.8% kind of corresponds to an effective sample size of 56 quarters. It's sort of useful to think about how the agent is now going to perceive subjective uncertainty, right? The agent is as uncertain as you would be, roughly speaking, if you had, you know, seen 56 quarters of data and your prior beliefs were uninformed. Yeah? That's, that's sort of, and so that's, that's, that's quite a substantial uh, uncertainty that the agent faces here. Okay, um, before we go on and I show you what happens in a model, I wanna discuss a few things that are, one has to keep in mind in models with subjective belief dynamics. And this, this also connects to what we discussed earlier today about the law of iterated expectations. Uh, and these are sort of more broader conceptual issues that go beyond our specific model. They can also come up in other types of, um, subjective beliefs model. So I, I think it's useful rather than spending a lot of time today looking exactly at, at the calibration and everything, it's probably more important that we spend uh, some time on these, these kind of deeper uh, conceptual issues uh, that, that also apply to other models. Yeah. And so this fading memory assumption here actually introduces some issues that one could easily perhaps overlook. Yeah. Um, and some, some you know, some key differences to the way this would work out in a, in a, in a standard full memory Bayesian learning model. Yeah? So recall, with an uninformed prior in a full memory Bayesian model, this posterior mean would be an equal weighted, not an exponentially weighted average, 
And what would also happen is that if the HNR thinks about how her posterior beliefs are going to evolve in the future, it's a standard result in you know, Bayesian learning that the agent would expect her posterior to evolve as a martingale in the future. Okay? And this is basically just reflecting the fact that the agent cannot predict, you know, if the beliefs are optimal, you cannot predict where the beliefs are gonna go in the future. And with a lot of iterated expectations that then also implies, you know, that you, yeah, that, that you basically get a martingale out of this. And in the fading memory model, this is kind of not a danger. Um, you can write uh, this updating equation that I had earlier. Let me, show, let me just go back to equation seven, right? So again, just constant gain updating. By, by, by uh, using the definition of this delta C, I can write this, rewrite this. I can say, uh, you know, again, updating, constant gain updating, uh, but now rewriting the, the surprise term as uh, an epsilon tilde shock, which is basically the surprise in the numerator now scaled by what is basically the subjective volatility from the agent's viewpoint of that surprise. And so from the, from the agent's viewpoint, that epsilon tilde is a normal zero one shock subjectively from the agent's viewpoint. And, and um, the updating is basically a function of that. And so if you look at this now, this equation here, you might be led to conclude, well, this looks like a mountain gill, right? You have here the mutility and you're adding a standard normal shock to it. And then you just keep iterating and this iterates further. Yeah? So it looks like a martingale, but it's actually not. And we'll discuss why. It actually turns out that when the agent looks more than one period into the future, the agent would realize if the agent is you know, rational enough, the agent would realize that these future epsilon tildes are actually negatively serially correlated. They are not uncorrelated like they would be with a melting gill. Yeah? And again, I wanna highlight this because you might bump into similar sort of things when you look at other models of belief dynamics where certain things that we often take for granted uh, uh, actually don't, don't necessarily uh, apply there. Yeah? And, so for that for that to happen, does the agent have to know that they have fading memory? You said rational. Precisely. Memory. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that that will be the thing that, that if the agent, of course, you could always specify that the agent just believes that these epsilon tildes are uncorrelated, right? That would be a way of specifying beliefs. That's that, you know, it's a possibility. But if you if you do want the agent to be aware that her future self or you know future agents are going to have memory that faded, then you're going to get this epsilon tilde to be negatively serially correlated. So that's basically what I just, what I wanna explain uh, now, right? And uh, maybe a useful way of thinking through this is the following. Think about an agent's perception. So the agent is at time T and the agent now thinks about the mu tilde at some, the posterior mean at some future date, you know, and think of n as being large, right? This is this is the agent thinks, what is my posterior mean going to be, you know, hundred years from now, very far in the future. Okay. Now, imagine the agent now is now aware that her future self, hundred years from now, will have learned with fading memory, with this gain of one point eight percent. Well, then the agent knows that her future self a hundred years from now is basically going to put zero weight on any delta Cs that are in the current agent's memory set, right? They're gonna get basically zero weight. They're gonna be downweighted already, right? Okay. And this is gonna be the same, no matter whether 
it's like 50 years ahead, 100 years ahead, 200 years ahead. All of those are going to basically put zero weight on anything that happened before T. And so the agent now thinks, well, 50 years ahead, 100 years ahead, 200 years ahead, all of those are going to be some exponentially weighted average of some future dividend growth, uh, some future endowment growth observations. So distribution-wise, they're going to look identical to the agent today, right? The agent is going to think, well, they are identical. They are basically identically distributed. The 50-year head posterior mean, the 100-year head, the 200-year head. And this means that the subjective variance of these future posterior means, right? If the agent now thinks, out how, how uncertain am I about those? How, how much could they vary? Well, it's going to be the same. They are identically distributed from the viewpoint of today's agent. Okay. But they are all based on this accumulation of these epsilons, but yet have the same variance, no matter how many periods you go ahead into the future. The only way this can happen, that you can accumulate according to this updating, this epsilon tildes, and yet that variance stays constant in the future, is if these epsilon tildes are negatively correlated. Yeah. And this would be very different with a, with a martingale, right? With a martingale, you would be adding shocks to it more and more. And the further the agent looks in the future, the agent would say, the further I look into the future, my uncertainty about future posterior means is going to grow. Yeah? That's not happening here. Yeah? And the key difference is here, these epsilon totals are negatively serially correlated. Yeah? Okay, but it's very easy to miss because if you look at this, you might just think, oh, yeah, this is a modern girl, right? But it's not. So, this is sort of the one way of looking at this. Um, there's also another way to sort of intuitively think about this, which is, you know, where, where does this negative correlation come from? Well, again, put your sh sh yourself into the shoes of an agent looking ahead, thinking about the agent at time, you know, 100 years from now, posterior mean. The agent today will know that this future agent will basically overreact in a way to those future endowment growth observations that at that time will be recent and that some of this will eventually revert, right? Because it's, it's uh, from, from the viewpoint of today, uh, the, the agent is, is aware that the limited memory or the fading memory of a future agent will induce in a way some excess sensitivity to these uh, 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 recent endowment growth observations. It's sort of another way of, of thinking about this. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if you, you write down a model of subjective belief dynamics, it's kind of important to think about, uh, about these sort of subtle issues about you know, how, how, how are the agents thinking about the evolution of the beliefs of you know, herself or future, uh, future agents. And there could be some, some tricky issues coming in there. And this now also connects to our earlier discussion at the beginning today about the law of iterated expectations. Yeah. Because this negative serial correlation here now violates the law of iterated expectations. Yeah. We can see this in the following way. So, you know, it is true in our model that the one period ahead expectation, you know, the expectation of the agent of the one period ahead epsilon tilde is always zero. It's just that for future, you know, beyond the next period, these epsilons are seen as correlated. These epsilon tildes are seen as correlated by the, by the agent. But the, for the next period, it's always zero. And if you, if you, you know, if you had the law of iterated expectations holding, this would automatically imply that you know, expectations of kind of future cross products uh, uh, of, these, of these epsilon tildes would also have to be zero, right? Uh, that's um, rather than negative. Yeah? So this, this, cannot, this cannot hold, right? So if you just 
take this here, this cross product expectation, and you plug in the fact that this expectation should be zero. And if the law of iterated expectations holds, then this, this should be just all zero. But the thing is, the law of iterated expectation doesn't hold. And there's also no reason really why, that it should hold. If you look carefully at the assumptions that are required for the law of iterated expectations to hold. So if you look, look into this, what you'll see is that the assumption is that there is a filtration underlying the uh, information structure. And the filtration basically rules out loss of memory. Information doesn't get thrown away there. You could sometimes get situations where information becomes irrelevant and then it doesn't matter, you don't use it. But there is no loss of information that has useful, uh, a useful role to play, right? Um, and so in the fading memory model, this doesn't hold. This down weighting of past data basically violates that, that assumption. Yeah? So this is where the basic sources of all of this. And again, this could be something that, that uh, is happening in other subjective beliefs models too. Uh, so for example, Andre Schleifer and co-authors have a whole series of papers on diagnostic expectations. And in some versions of those models, you also get a violation of the law of iterated expectations. Yeah? So it's, it's something to watch out for uh, in, in models with subjective beliefs. What does this now, you know, why does this matter for asset prices? Well, you know, for asset valuation, of course, the law of iterated expectation is often quite important. This is sort of a standard thing that we use and, and uh, we cannot rely on this here, right? And so uh, we need to look into this more, in more detail. Okay, so let me illustrate it with a, with a, a simple example what the, what the issue is here with this. Um, so let's, let's uh, let M, this M here, denote a one period stochastic discount factor. Um, and you know that, that SDF itself could depend on the agent's beliefs at time t in some sort of way. Uh, um, so we can allow for that. Um, and let's now consider possible valuation approaches we could take here, right? So, so one uh, approach that one could take is that, um, let's just check one thing, just one second. Yeah, okay. So um, one approach we could take is that the agent takes what one could call a resale valuation approach. Yeah, so there's a, a payoff at, t plus two, and the agent at time t is now thinking in order to value the asset about the price that the asset will fetch at time t plus one. And then once the agent has figured out an expectation about this price at time t plus one, the agent is then going to you know, iterate back to time t. Yeah? Okay. And so what would be the agent's uh, valuation at T plus one, well, it would be based on the subjective beliefs of the agent at T plus one. Okay, and then the resale valuation would be, we say the agent uh, at time T has some subjective beliefs about the cross product of the SDF and this price of the asset at T plus one. And this gives us this valuation. Yeah? Okay, again, if the law of iterated expectations would apply, then this would all collapse to just a t, time t expectation. That's clear, right? But we cannot do this here, right? We have already figured that out. The alternative would be a buy and hold valuation, what you could call a buy and hold valuation, where the agent just doesn't think about the price next period, but just directly looks ahead to the payoff of the asset at time t plus one, and then says, okay, uh, you know, I have some. SDFs, I have an SDF for this T plus two payoff, which is basically my product of my single period SDFs. And I'm valuing the asset directly based on this. Yeah. It's also a possibility. And another law of iterated expectations, of course, both of these would be the same, right? This is why we typically, you know, in, in a rational expectations model, we don't discuss uh, these different ways of valuing the asset because they lead to the same thing. 
Um, but in the faded memory model, that's not the case. And so there we have to take a stand on which of these two valuation approaches we want to take. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess we discussed this already. Um, yeah, let, let me go to this. So, you know, which one do we use? Um, we opted for the resale valuation because the buy and hold valuation is in a way, you know, kind of time inconsistent. So when the agent is pricing the asset with buy and hold, the agent is basically thinking uh, at time T that the payoff of the asset in the future will involve some, this epsilon tilde that we discussed, which is, you know, negatively serially correlated with the epsilon tilde at T plus one. Uh, so the agent basically thinks when, when, when you then work through the pricing, the agent is incorporating this negative zero correlation or this predictability of this epsilon tilde T plus one. But then time moves on to T plus one. The agent has some memory loss and now suddenly finds that this epsilon tilde T plus one is unpredictable, right? So this is a, there's a bit of tension uh, there. Um, the resale valuation doesn't have that, which is, seems kind of nice. Um, the resale valuation also fits in a way better with the underlying motivation of this whole approach, because if you recall, the way we are thinking about this model is sort of as, a, as an approximation for experience-based learning that in the real world is really happening at the cohort level. And, you know, at that, in, the, in that heterogeneous agent version of the model, you would actually get actual resale of assets when generations turn over, right? And so in that sense, it's maybe also uh, more consistent with the spirit of the model. All this said, I think there is a question here about what agents in the real world, how they really form beliefs and how they value assets. And uh, one could certainly imagine, you know, studies of this question with experiments, maybe with empirical data of some sort, that is trying to figure out what is sort of the right way uh, of modeling this. So the way we do it, it seems plausible to us and sort of fitting within the spirit of what we are trying to do. Uh, but I'm not, by no means suggesting that we have found necessarily the only one and right approach to deal uh, with this problem. Yeah. Um, but what I do wanna highlight is that in models with subjective beliefs, it's important to think through these kinds of, kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, here's another sort of, again, again, a somewhat issue that's a little bit more general than just our model, which is uh, that sometimes what's happening with these subjective beliefs actually looks like it can be mapped into a, a what you could call a rational model or maybe a full memory uh, Bayesian model, uh, and how to interpret this. Yeah? And so. In our case, if you look at this updating equation, this constant gain updating scheme, uh, those of you who are familiar with common filtering might recognize that this just looks just like a steady state common filter for a latent stochastic trend, right? So if you had, if you had the endowment process to actually have a stochastic trend mu t here that's varying over time, and that is a martingale, then the steady state common filter would give you exactly this kind of filtering equation for this uh, latent stochastic trend. And so this brings up the question now, well, could we actually reinterpret this model here as one of optimal rational filtering? And the answer is yes and no. So the, the yes component is that yes, you could say that the agent, um, you could interpret the model as agent, the agent believing that this here is the true data generating process that generates the endowment growth. And then the agent, based on this belief that this is the underlying process, the agent, you know, applies common filtering uh, and, and, uh, and optimally tracks this perceived stochastic trend. Uh, 
But the important thing is to get the same asset pricing implications as the fading memory model, it would still have to be true that in reality, this mu is constant. So that this endowment growth here with the latent stochastic trend is just a perceived process that the agent thinks endowment growth follows. When in fact, there is actually no stochastic trend. The true process has mu just equal to, to constant. Yeah. And why is this important? Well, the asset pricing implications of the model are going to be driven by the wedge between objective beliefs or objective, you know, objective truth and the agent's subjective beliefs. And so if you do away with this wedge, you would not get the predictability results. You would not get, you know, time varying objective risk premia come out of the model and so forth. Yeah? So, so to get the same asset pricing results, it is important that there is a belief switch. Yeah? But one can, you could reinterpret the model, reinterpret the model as the agent perceiving uh, that there is a stochastic trend there. Yeah? And in fact, when we solve the model for some technical purposes, it's actually useful to reformulate the model in this way. Uh, and 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 this allows us to map it into some existing uh, existing results, but um, but it's just for for technical reasons. Uh, Alexi, did any questions come up? This might be a good time. <clears throat> we don't have a backup backlog right now, but if anyone wants to uh -huh. wants to chime in, um, as you said, it's a good time. Uh, yes, um, if, if, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I think in the Andre and Kujan 2017 paper, like there's this mechanism whereby private heterogeneous information can generate positive correlation between residuals. So I'm wondering, like, is there a way to use like different potential forces of, um, uh, of subjective beliefs to maybe cancel out the biases and get us closer to a martingale? Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Um, it's that it, uh, that you know some of them could have a countervailing effect there. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's all I can say about this. Yeah, so I guess that's a possibility. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I just had a quick question uh -huh. about um, the agents. So uh, when we were talking about the agents are smart enough to know they're going to forget information. Uh -huh. This sort of has like a metacognitive feel hard enough to remind themselves of the data uh -huh. they're forgetting. Uh -huh. um, is it in their preferences that there's, you know, they have this built-in loss and they're like, well, I'm going to forget data, but I have no benefit because I don't, you know, respect old data. Could you just talk a little bit about why they might not try to keep the old information around? Yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of a psychological question, right? So that kind of goes back to uh, the empirical evidence that, you know, motivates our paper. Why do people focus so much on lifetime experience and don't, don't keep it and also don't, you know, study historical data maybe from before their lifetimes? Uh, and I don't have an answer to that, to that question, yeah, we basically have the empirical observation that th this seems to be what's going on. Uh, so there are certain, you know, certainly th psychological theories of that, but I think none of them sp speaks kind of specifically to the kind of patterns that we find. So we cannot claim that this has a, you know, a deep psychological grounding. Um, but it's sort of one aspect. The other one is, uh, a little bit separate from this is, you know, given this, let's let's suppose this is true for some reason. Uh, maybe this is just how we are wired that that we tend to, you know, forget stuff and put more weight on on stuff that we saw ourselves and stuff that we saw more recently. But this still doesn't answer the question about how people think about our own belief or other agents' beliefs in the future. Right. And so how rational, for example, are we in assessing this? And, and, and so uh, in a way that what we have assumed in this model is quite, to some extent, you know, hyper rational in the sense that the agent thinks very, very carefully about how future agents will have some memory loss and, and, and so forth. And this may be too extreme. Um, 
but from a modeling viewpoint, it was kind of driven in our case by the desire to just make one tweak to the standard Bayesian learning model and see what this does, right? And just make this fading memory twist and keep everything else the same as in the Bayesian learning model. Um, and, uh, but this doesn't mean that other tweaks could maybe not also be important or, or you know, empirically successful, right? And so, and so I think future research could well take a different view on this. Uh, but for now, we just wanted to make one tweak to the to the model so that we know exactly what's driving what, where where it's coming from. We have um, one more question from Claudia mm -hmm. Moise. Uh, hi, Claudia. Do you want to jump in and ask your question? Hi, Alex. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, the question that I have is that. Um, so Stefan, is this deviation from the posterior from a marking uh, that you assume here uh, due to the fading memory property, um, does this lead to systematic misvaluation by investors in their investments? And would this explain some pricing anomalies? I don't know, maybe you mentioned this and I may have missed it. Uh, and the other thing, uh, so looking at the, uh, one of the graphs that you um, showed at the beginning of the presentation, it looks like the bias seems to be cohort specific and maybe decreasing through time. So again, I will relate this to us. So would this explain some, um, some decreasing profitability of some investment strategies through time? So with regards to the first question, um, Actually, so now, can you just repeat the first question? I, I was just following another thought and I forgot about the Sorry, I was speaking too fast. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, uh, I'm going back to um, the result that you have about the deviation of your perspective. Ah, yeah, okay, now I remember, yeah, so, I remember. Yes, yeah, so with the, yeah, uh, yeah. to the fading yeah. uh, memory. Uh, um, so, so, I mean, in our model, it does give rise to, you know, uh, return predictability, right? So we're focusing just on aggregates the aggregate stock market and explaining asset pricing facts about the aggregate stock market. But you do get return predictability, you know, based on a price dividend ratio and other kinds of predictors mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of empirically reasonable without having time varying risk or having time varying risk aversion, right? So this is kind of what we focus on. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, we haven't applied this in any way to any you know, cross-sectional kind of asset pricing exercises. Uh, but that's 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 what you what you get from this. So so these subjective belief dynamics that we assume basically give us uh, give us give us that. Uh, with regard to the second question, there is there is no uh, decay of the you know the magnitude of these belief wedges or the the the, the sort of. Uh, magnitudes of the agent errors over time. Everything is stationary here, right? The agents are always forgetting memory, uh, and and this just keeps repeating. So there's no there's no decay of this. So so in that sense, the model doesn't speak to uh, decaying to to asset pricing puzzles that are kind of disappearing or something like this, right? Uh, that that's not not happening in the model. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. We have um, one more from Joel Perez. Uh, yep. Joel, do you want to jump in? It's yep. related to um, retail versus professional investors. Yep. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. So, how do you um, do? You think of fading memory as applying equally to retail investors and professional money managers? We know most of the money today is professionally managed, and these people have access to all sorts of systems and algos. So, is fading memory? To, should you take it literally as a psychological? Uh, you know deficiency yeah. or more metaphor for you know, I don't know, something more institutional, systemic. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, how to I guess, yeah, so, 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 so several thoughts on this. So first on, on the institutional money, how much institutional money manages is managed institutionally. I think a lot of institutional money is nevertheless in, in defined buckets where, you know, there are equity managers, there are bond managers and, you know, individuals do have by allocating flows in their retirement accounts and other accounts, they do have some, at least some influence on, on, on that. So I, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying individuals are irrelevant. I think for, at least for aggregates, the aggregate stock market, they are certainly relevant, but we are ignoring here the professional site. You know, there's certainly also 
professionals that will exert some influence there and they are ignoring this for now. Um, we haven't applied fading memory empirically to professional expectations yet. What we have done so far is one paper where we looked at, this is not quite exactly what you have in mind, but we looked at FOMC members, so at the Federal Reserve, and looked at their inflation expectations. And it turns out that fading memory also plays some role there, or learning from experience, you know, in the kind of with cross-sectional heterogeneity also plays a role there. So if you want to understand why different FOMC members have different inflation expectations at a given point in time, you can explain some of that with, you know, learning from experience. So that's at least a hint that even kind of technocrats, you know, might might uh, uh, might might also be subject to this. But it's you know one data point so far. But uh, but it would be useful to do this with data on on professional investors uh, as well. I agree. Um, and then for for professionals, I think what you just touched on in one sentence could also play a role, right? When I when I look at how professionals sometimes deal with data when I do back testing or any sort of analysis, I'm often struck by how short the time series are that they use, uh, and the data sometimes gets thrown away. The the the, the little attention that many on Wall Street pay to, to all historical data. And so maybe there are other, other facts, go, other, other forces going on that at an institutional level somehow uh, lead to a you know, loss of memory. I'm not sure. I'm just speculating at this point. But yeah, so I guess, yeah, these are all interesting questions and, and we only have a partial picture of this so far. Thanks. Okay, great. I think we're ready to move uh -huh. on. Okay. All right. So uh, this was uh, what we discussed so far is sort of the key part of the model of what the belief updating and uh, the rest now is to basically combine this with standard asset pricing machinery to figure out uh, what asset prices are, you know, equity premium, risk rate, and so forth. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to you know, do this relatively quickly here and, and go to the key results. So we're going to assume that the agent has absent SIM preferences. And this is actually uh, very important because the, um, as we discussed earlier, the agent is going to have a lot of subjective uncertainty about this dividend, this mean dividend growth. And this means that the agent basically has a high degree of subjective, what you could call subjective long run risk, right? Uh, this, uh, this long run dividend growth rate is uncertain in the agent's mind. And uh, relative to a full memory based in learning model, this fading memory amplifies this because it, it basically always keeps the agent in a state of having not so much data uh, to inform, uh, inform these beliefs. And so subjective uncertainty about long run growth uh, is high. And with Epstein SIM preferences and, and the sort of you know, standard assumptions about the parameters uh, of these preferences, this leads to a pretty big effect on, on risk premium. Okay, so with uh, Epstein SIM preferences, uh, intertemporal budget constraint, and then a baseline version of the model where we work with uh, an elasticity of intertemporal substitution equal to one. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you some results for that now. Yeah? The, the paper also has uh, some, you know, uh, robustness checks with uh, IES of 1.5 and so forth. But the, the results there are not drastically different. Okay. Um, using this, this analogy with, with, with the Kalman, optimal Kalman filtering that I mentioned earlier, this allows us to map our model basically into uh, Hansen, Heaton, and Lee. And they basically have already worked out how the SDF looks like then in this setting. We can, with some tweaks, uh, uh, directly rely on this. And so we get the following log SDF, which has uh, kind of two components that are intuitive, which is the first one, the conditional mean is controlled by mu tilde t. So the agent's subjective belief about uh, uh, or the agent's posterior mean 
about dividend growth. And that's intuitive, right? That's going to drive uh, the risk rate, time variation and the risk rate, and the conditional mean of the SDF. And then <clears throat> uh, risks that show up in the SDF basically trace back to these epsilon tilde shocks, right? These are these surprises that the agent perceives every period. And those get magnified by some price of risk uh, parameter. And this price of risk parameter then also relates to, um, importantly, this gain that, again, we're going to fix at 1.8%. But I just want to note here that it plays has an effect on magnifying risk premia here. So you can see if you make this, this new bigger, it get mul gets multiplied by a ratio of this delta. That's a, the, just a time discount factor. So this delta over 1 minus delta is a relatively big number. And so if you, this gets multiplied by this new, uh, this, this, this helps to magnify uh, the volatility of the SDF and hence um, uh, risk premia. Yeah? And again, this goes back to this idea that with higher, higher gain, uh, memory fades more quickly. And so the agent is going to be subjectively more uncertain uh, about long run growth. Okay. All right. Let me. So, uh, yeah. Uh, real quick, how do you do? Because you have Epstein Zinn now, mm -hmm. and it's very forward looking um, pricing kernel. Yep. How does the earlier discussion about the law of iterate expectations play in here? How, how do you compute the continuation values and all that? Uh, yeah, so basically always by walk, walking through with this resale evaluation approach, just go back. Yeah. Uh, basically by always walking through these expressions here without assuming the law of iterated expectations. Mm -hmm. Right, so at every point in time, you can compute this and then um, you can also compute the functional form of how this relates to earlier information. Uh, and then you can, you can work out what these, under the agent's beliefs, what these, these, these uh, products of these expectations are. Yeah. Yeah. But basically by walking through them backwards step-by-step step rather than, than, uh, than assuming that it's just all collapses under the law of the red expectations. Right, I see. And there are some issues about um, whether equilibrium even exists, right? With Epsonson, with this very uh, uh, high growth rate uncertainty. And so with, with C equals one, this all works out nicely. Um, but then once we go for, for the consumption claim, but when we go to the dividend claim, we also make, need to make sure that it actually exists. And so the paper also has some, some stuff on that. So we are very careful to make sure that uh, the parameters that they're using actually allow uh, the price actually to be finite and it, it can live to exist. Okay, so where was I? So we don't need to go through all of this. Uh, let me just show you what the results that you get with this now. Uh, so then we can talk about the, the intuition for this. Yeah, so if we, if we uh, look at the wealth return, in the model, which is basically you know, the return, the, the, the asset underlying the wealth return is just a, an asset that pays, uh, pays the endowment as a dividend, right? As a payoff. And then our W is just the return uh, on that asset. So it's, it's the return on the consumption claim or the, or the wealth return, uh, depending on how you want to call it. Um, and by plugging in, in this to the absence and oil equation, we can solve for the uh, subjective risk premium from the viewpoint of the agent of this wealth return. And this is the result that we get. And this kind of makes sense, right? So as the most important thing to note here is there's nothing time varying on the right-hand side. It's all constant, right? So we assume that risk is constant in the model. Uh, the SDF had a constant price of risk. Um, you know, since there's no time varying risk aversion, no time varying risk, there's nothing time varying under the subjective beliefs of the agents about the risk rate. But uh, we can also compute these expectations 
under the beliefs of the uh, of an objective outside observer. And there we will see a wedge. And this is very similar to what we saw earlier in our, in our very simple Campbell-Schiller present value identity calculations, that you basically get a beliefs wedge that ties back to the beliefs wedge uh, about uh, dividend growth, right? So mu is what the, uh, or endowment growth, mu is what the true mean endowment growth rate is, and mu total t is what the agent believes it is at time t. And the difference between the two um, basically drives this belief switch. Yeah? There's also a, a, you know, a Jensen's inequality term here, uh, but that's not so, not so important here. It's constant anyway, right? So, so time variation would come in this belief switch would come from time variation in the agent's beliefs. Okay, and now combining these two, our result for the uh, subjective view of the agent about the wealth return and the belief switch gives us now the objective equity premium. And it's basically a constant, uh, the subjective premium plus this belief switch. And so this is time varying. And so we get a time varying. Uh, uh, risk premium, objective risk premium on the consumption claim. Okay. Uh, now, as you know, standard in 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 many asset pricing uh, models, we're going to assume that dividends are a leveled claim to the endowment, and then we're gonna you know we're gonna first now write down what this how this leverage relationship directly looks like. And then we're going to evaluate what the risk premium are for this, for this dividend claim. Um, so dividends are going to be a levered version of endowment growth. And we're also assuming, and this is, I guess, empirically certainly realistic that there's a certain, that there's co-integration. So when dividends move away far from consumption, that there is a force that pulls them back together, right? So that dividends and consumption stay uh, co-integrated. Um, but this, this, this uh, force that kind of pulls them together could be very weak, right? This doesn't have to be a, a strong force, but it is required in a model to have some co-integration. Otherwise, prices are going to blow up uh, because that growth rate uncertainty um, is strong enough in this model, the subjective uncertainty about growth, that the fact that the asset price is convex in growth rates would lead basically the, the valuation to blow up if you didn't have if you didn't have co-integration. Yeah. But as I said, it's also, I guess, economically plausible. It doesn't really make sense to think of an economy where dividends could wander. Uh, infinitely far away from uh, from consumption, and there's no force kind of pulling them pulling them together. Okay, and then um, we evaluate now prices of dividend strips, right? So we think about a claim to one dividend and periods into the future, and we can we evaluate the price of that using. Uh, without relying on the law of iterated expectations, right? So we just go step uh, backwards, step by step, instead of just having all of these expectations collapse into the time t expectation. Okay. Um, when we do all this and plug in, you know, uh, the underlying processes and and the assumptions about the beliefs, what we get is a price dividend ratio for this. For this dividend strip that, uh, that uh, has an intuitive relation here to this mutual T. So when the agents are more optimistic about future growth, so mutual T is high after a string of you know good endowment growth observations, um, the price dividend ratio is going to be high. Uh, 
And this effect is magnified if there's more leverage, right? So if lambda is, is, is you know, three instead of two, uh, you're going to get uh, a, a bigger effect on the price dividend ratio. And also if there's this co-integration force is weaker, so alpha is smaller, uh, then you would also get a bigger effect uh, on the price dividend ratio. And again, this is kind of, again, closely connected to this simple Campbell-Schiller present value identity calculations that we did earlier today. Yeah. Price dividend ratio connected to subjective beliefs about growth. Okay, and so once we have um, prices for individual dividend strips, we can then also look at uh, a dividend claim that's a, uh, the claim to a whole you know, stream of, of, uh, of dividends out to infinity, and that would just be the sum of the dividend strip prices. Okay, uh, we can also get returns on these dividend strips uh, just by looking at the ratio of the price and then compute expectations for those. Okay? And so I basically want to show you, um, for, for the dividend claim, that's a claim to the whole stream of dividends. We don't have a closed form expression for what the risk premium is. You know, we do it in, 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 in numerically, of course. Uh, but the nice thing about these dividend strips is that we can actually write down a closed form expression for the risk premium and then look at what it varies with. And so I just want to show you that. Um, and so what, what I'm going to show you is the return on an infinite horizon dividend strip, right? And so think about um, uh, the return next period of a claim that today had a maturity of n periods. And so next period will have n minus one, right? And then we just let this n go to infinity. So we think about uh, the return next period of a claim to a, a dividend very, very far in the future. Okay, so here's how this risk premium looks like on such an you know, infinite horizon uh, dividend strip. Um, again, it's constant, right? There's no time varying risk aversion here. There's no time varying risk. And so naturally there's no time varying, no time T subscript uh, on the right-hand side here. Yeah. And then again, we get some intuitive you know, uh, effects here. So higher price of risk would mean higher risk premium, higher leverage would mean higher risk premium, um, a, small, a, a bigger gain, so more strongly fading memory, again, would amplify uh, the risk premium. This is how it looks like subjectively to agents. Uh, this is how it looks like objectively to an outside observer with objective expectations. So the objective risk premium is again the subjective one, some constants that have some Jensen's inequality terms in there. And then importantly, the beliefs wedge, right? So as before, for the consumption claim, the, the wedge in beliefs between the truth, the mu, and what the agent believes the mu is in terms of posterior mean is driving these, these, uh, the variation over time in this objective risk premium. And so this is something that predictive regressions should pick up. If the econometrician runs predictive regressions on data, for example, using a proxy for this mutility, the um, then this should pick up this uh, predictability. Yeah? And this would be variation in, in objective risk premia in the data that would be counter-cyclical, right? So if dividend growth has been very good for a number of years, prices are high, future returns are going to be low. Um, let me show you some calibration results. So the gain is fixed at 1.8%, which I mentioned previously, and leverage at three, uh, co-integration very weak, um, risk aversion at four, so you know pretty small. We don't need a large value of risk aversion. Um, and then we get the following moments. So the baseline version of the model is this one here with learning <clears throat> and up C equals one. And uh, 
Then we go to the asset pricing moments, just to give you an idea of how this looks like. Actually, I have it here. Um, so we get an equity premium of, of close to 7%. Uh, the volatility is still a little bit lower than in the data. So this is, I think, still a shortcoming of the model. I think I kind of know what's missing in the model. You know, the, the model only has uh, uh, second moments, uh, uh, kind of types of risks. There is no crashes. There is no uh, disasters in the model. And in the empirical data, we do seem to see those. And it does no neg you know, there's no strong source of negative skewness in the model. Uh, and I think this is this is the main thing that's kind of missing from the model. So something that gives us somewhat more violent crashes in the, in in the, in than than what this model produces. Um, risk to rate is kind of reasonable, not quite the same as in the data, but quite close. And in particular, it's not it's not volatile, right? So we get a, a high equity premium uh, without a volatile risk free rate. Okay, but the key thing is to reproduce at least roughly these predictive regression results that I showed you earlier, right? So sort of one of the main things that the model is trying to do is to give us variation in the price dividend ratio and predictable variation in, in stock market excess returns without having to rely on time varying risk aversion and time varying risk. Yeah? And uh, what we get in the simulated data is a coefficient of minus 2.26 empirically we had a bigger one but you know that one also came with a substantial standard error so <clears throat> i think the the model actually gets quite close to reproducing the predictability that we see in the data what about the survey expectations errors right so clearly we we don't only want the model to match asset pricing data um, we also wanted to capture some key facts about this uh the series of investor uh, return expectations that I showed you. And the way we can look at this is by looking at the expectations errors. Are they predictable in sort of a similar way as they were predictable in the actual empirical data? And the answer is yes. So if you take these expectations errors, the wedge between your realized returns and investors' expectations, and you regress them on this mutual D, you bet. In a model, you get a coefficient of uh, minus 10, and empirically, we had minus 12. Huh? So this is quite close. OK, so you know the, the, the model has, the, the paper has a, a, a number of other things. So we, we look at you know, uh, an IES different from, from one. Uh, there's also some. Uh, some discussion of you know out of sample predictability. I mentioned this earlier that in this model, even though there is in sample predictability that's quite strong um, for a reasonable sample, there is not much or no essentially no out of sample predictability of returns. So this there's no easy money making opportunity in this model, which kind of is good to know because it kind of makes it a little bit more reasonable. It wouldn't be very reasonable to have a model where there's a lot of money. Uh, kind of laying around on the street to be picked up. Um, so if you're interested, I would encourage you to, you know, have a have a look at the at the paper on this. Um, I want to summarize and then maybe just a two minutes, uh, a few remarks about a uh, few other directions that one could take here uh, in this in this sort of area of asset pricing, and then we'll have maybe five minutes left for for some more for some final questions. Okay, so just to summarize what, what, what I've shown you here, um, I showed you learning with fading memory as sort of one possible model of subjective belief dynamics and how one can you know, set up an asset pricing model that uses these subjective belief dynamics to, to you know, produce some standard uh, asset pricing facts like you know, time varying volatile stock market valuation levels you know, captured by the price dividend ratio predictability of excess returns, a high equity premium, stable risk rate, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, also matching the fact that uh, you know, survey expectations do not show us these counter-cyclical 
expected excess returns that predictive regression show us, right? And so the model goes a long way in explaining this wedge between objective beliefs and subjective beliefs, and also the predictability of survey uh, forecast errors. Yeah. All right. Now it is also, of course, you know, one particular uh, a tweak of the standard Bayesian Bayesian model that gave us these results, but there is a whole bunch of you know, questions that are partly still open uh, that I want to briefly mention. There, there, you know, there's others, but this is just a selection of a few things that I find interesting. Um, I've also noted for each one, for most of them, just a piece of initial work uh, that kind of goes in this direction, but there is uh, none of this is providing a complete answer uh, to these questions. Yeah? So um, one issue that already came up today is, you know, this heterogene potential heterogeneity in beliefs between individuals and professionals. I focus today on uh, individual investor expectations. If you look at expectations of professional investors, there are some different dynamics there. And at the end of the day, maybe what we would want is a model that captures has some heterogeneity and maybe captures both the beliefs of individuals as, as well as those uh, uh, of, of professionals. And maybe they you know, trade against each other in equilibrium or something, I guess. Uh, so one fact that seems to be in the data, for example, is that uh, professional investors, if you look at their forecasts, how it relates to the return uh, during the past uh, years of very recent returns, they seem to be contrarian with regards to that. So when the returns were high, they tend to have uh, uh, make a low, low return forecast. And for individuals, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, and so you could imagine a model where you know, individuals and professionals are kind of trading against each other. And um, the mo model by Valberis it all kind of already has this kind of flavor, um, but it's a, it's a partial equilibrium model, for example, you know, they assume a, an exogenous risk rate and so forth. So it would be useful to think whether one could maybe uh, push this further towards a more GE type of uh, type of setting. Um, their results are also very much focused on on these recent extrapolation from recent returns, very recent, like the last year, the last quarter. Um, but uh, you know, this is also just a partial picture, as I showed you today. This these influence of kind of long run experiences of dividend growth over many, many years also seem to play a big role in, in, in helping understand uh, asset price movements. And so you know, maybe there's a way of bringing this together somehow. Uh, I'm not sure. Another thing that hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet is, is formation of beliefs about other stuff than the first moment. Yeah? So for example, volatility. Um, so Lars Lockster and Talimur have a recent paper where they look at volatility expectations, um, but Apart from their paper, there hasn't been uh, much on this yet. And you know, you could also think not just about, about volatility, but also you know, tail events. So how does how do people learn about tail events, probabilities? How do they update? How do they keep them in their memory? Um, how should we specify people's subjective beliefs about about tail events? Uh, sort of a largely open question. Um, Colin Dufresne and I'll have uh, already written down a, a, a model, but that's a full memory Bayesian learning model, which is not necessarily you know, empirically the right way of, of capturing agents' expectations. So I think it would be uh, that's sort of an interesting area to, to think about um, for more future work. One thing, getting a little bit further away from what we discussed, um, one thing that is kind of of my personal interest these days is to also understand belief formation in settings where agents are faced with a huge amount of information, right? So think about a cross-sectional setting with firms where each firm's payoffs can depend on, you know, hundreds of different, maybe thousands of different variables. And if a forecaster wants to form beliefs about these payoffs, uh, that's in a way a, a, you know, a very high dimensional uh, prediction problem. And there are some interesting, interesting issues about how agents you know, deal with such a high dimensional 
uh, prediction problem. And so Ian and Martin and I have a have a paper that kind of goes in this direction, but it's still you know uh, under some arguably very specific and simplifying assumptions. And I, I think there's a, a a lot of different approaches one could take uh, on this problem. And then finally, there is uh, this question of memory formation and retrieval for memory, right? We touched on this briefly today during the, uh, during the Q&A session, you know, what is sort of the foundation of how people keep th things in memory and, and can one uh, kind of develop a micro foundation uh, for that? And uh, Jessica Wachter, for example, has been engaged in some work with co-authors uh, recently going in this kind of direction. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to tell you about. And uh, I think we have a few more questions, a few more minutes for, for questions, if there are any. Yes, um, we do have one question hot out of the oven here. Um, Ali, would you like to, to ask it? Sure, thanks. So I, I guess this goes back to some of the things you mentioned, the subtle issues you get uh, mm -hmm. when, when we have um, fading memory, but what, like, is there something funny going on when we have fading uh, memory with regards to the transversality and the no bubble conditions? Like, how, how do we think about those sorts of conditions that are, you know, in the limit when we, we have this sort of memory problem? Um, I don't think there's anything funny going on, but there is this issue that because of the high degree of subjective growth rate uncertainty, you can basically get the price, the, the, the value of the asset become infinity. So basically, in another words of saying, another way of saying this, the, uh, the discounted value of these very distant uh, payoffs very far in the future kind of blows up. So that, that can happen in the model. Uh, if you don't have... For example, if we if we had if we didn't have co-integration in the model, uh, that that's what would basically happen there. But uh, but other than that, I don't think there's something specific where fading memory somehow creates a a problem with regards to the transversal condition. Fading memory can increase the subjective uncertainty about long run growth, and then via the convex relation between price and growth rates can kind of lead to a blow up of the of the valuation. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Feel free to jump in. Um, Matt? Matt Kelly? Um, yeah, I was just wondering about uh, perhaps I should read this uh, last paper you uh, mentioned about the memory formation in the uh, uh -huh. the MBR MBR working paper, but just a question about what kinds of micro foundations for this memory loss phenomena. Um, you know, is there a cost to retaining memory, and uh -huh. uh, you know, different investors may face different uh, different cost functions for retaining memory. This might might connect to the uh, conversation earlier about. Uh, professional versus retail investors. Uh -huh. Thanks. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so uh, I can at this point also only speculate about this. Um, you could imagine, you know, writing a model where there is some cost of uh, of storing memory, and and uh, I don't quite recall the details of uh, the Wachter and Kahana model, but some of it may have. A flavor of this that there's either some cost or a constraint on on how much you can store in memory basically right uh, and and uh, they try to connect it to models that psychologists have worked with to explain experimental evidence on people's memory right and so um of course this this you know pushes the question in a way one level deeper right if you assume a cost or a constraint uh, where does, does it come from? And, you know, again, just speculating, maybe there's a, a work that gives you a neurological basis for this or something like this, but I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you. I mean, in general, it seems like costs of information storage have only declined over mm -hmm. a long period of time. Yeah. 
Could I have a question, please? Yeah, sure. Um, wrap up. Uh, St Stefan, you've written past papers saying like people remember stuff like the Great Depression for many decades. Uh, and they behave differently than, you know, younger people who haven't seen old stuff. So it seems your past work, people had extremely long memories. Uh, no, no, actually quite to the contrary. So what we assumed here with this gain updating is exactly in line with what our earlier paper said. So mm -hmm. in the depression babies paper, we didn't say that memory lasts forever. But we said that, you know, people focus on their lifetime experiences more than on other data. And we estimated in the paper uh, how people weight their lifetime experiences. And so if you look into the paper, there's a weighting function that we estimated, which has basically a half-life of something like, I forgot the exact number, something like 15 years, these weights. So the weight you put on your, the last observation you had seen is about twice as high as on an observation 15 years ago, right? So memory does decay. That's 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 already in that paper. Okay. Okay. I think uh, we need to wrap up. Please um, join me in thanking Stefan for a great presentation on this uh, very important topic. Um, I also want to thank all the participants and those who asked questions. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another talk uh, by David Tesmar, who's going to be talking about micro foundations for macro finance. Uh, so again, thanks a lot, Stefan. Um, and thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Bye, everyone.